Okay, so welcome everyone to the Division of Surgery and Interventional Science uh, Student Research Symposium. Um, I'm so excited to be doing this face-to-face -face in the real world and not just virtual on a screen. Um, but before we get started, uh, I think some of you know me, but many of you might not. So my name's uh, Professor Tom Carlson. I'm a professor of assistive robotics, um, and I'm here today in my capacity as head of education for the Division of Surgery. I'm also a Vice Dean um, Education for the Faculty of Medical Sciences as well. Um, so I think something that's really special about this symposium is that it's not something that I dreamt up, it's not something that any of my colleagues dreamt up, but it's something that we developed together with students. Okay? So those of you who are student reps might have sat in the uh, staff student consultative committee meetings with me um, that I chair, and we go over some of the challenges that you're having as students whilst you're studying and we talk about some of the good practice that goes on that we'd like to share and we come up with ideas about how we can improve your student experience um, here within Division of Surgery and at UCL in general. And one of the, the ideas that came up was students wanted an opportunity to see what else is going on across the division. They wanted an opportunity to present their work and get feedback from their peers and just meet a few different people with different ideas. And one of the best ways to do that is through a symposium. So we started off uh, back in 2019, a face-to-face, -face, very small uh, symposium up in Stanmore, which is where my lab is, is based. Um, and there it was just for some postgraduate taught students uh, to see how it went. It went quite well. We enjoyed it. We had a bit of food and drink afterwards. People got chatting. And then we talked about it at the next uh, SSCC meeting. And people across the division were like, well, why is it just happening in Stanmore? Why don't we do it across the whole division? So then we decided, yeah, let's do a bigger event and we'll expand it. Um, so in 2020, we were going to do a nice big event. And then, of course, we had COVID. But that didn't stop us. We did a, a lovely online event um, where people uploaded videos onto uh, Moodle. We could do it all asynchronously. We did some live sessions on, on Zoom. Um, and the feedback was surprisingly good. I wasn't expecting great things, to be honest. Uh, but it did allow everyone to get together and share ideas. So we continued that um, in for 2021, when unfortunately it had to be live, uh, live online again. So this was uh, one of the uh, discussion sessions last year. Um, and we, we actually opened it up. So originally it was just for postgraduate students, but last year we opened it up to undergraduate students, postgraduate taught students, and postgraduate research students, because everybody wants to share their ideas and, and hear about what's going on. Um, so that sort of grown and as I said it's a partnership between uh, students and staff and that's really important that it's not just staff setting this up but students are actively involved and I know it's customary to say thank yous at the end but I think it's really important that I thank a few people at the beginning because if it weren't for them we wouldn't be here today so firstly thank you to Dr Susan Heavey who has brought together a fantastic committee um, to actually set up the symposium, decide how it's going to run, uh, infuse people and badger people to, uh, to submit something, even though you're all really busy doing other things in your life. It's Easter break, you've got projects to submit and things. I realise that, but thank you, everyone. Thank you, Susan, for drumming up uh, all the, the enthusiasm there. Um, but it wasn't just Susan. She involved... Um, uh, several students in, in the uh, event as well. So we've got Annie Kataki, who's a postgraduate research student, and she's actually a student rep. So thank you, Annie. And we also have uh, Katharina Pedersen, who is an MSci student on the medical sciences and engineering. Um, so she's finishing off things as well, but has been actively involved in, in putting together the symposium. And none of this would work if we didn't have decent support from our admin team behind the scenes as well. So I don't think I see Sean here with us today. But uh, Sean Massey has done a fantastic job uh, coordinating everything uh, behind the scenes as well. So let's thank the organising committee now, right at the beginning, so I don't forget to at the end. Thank you. 
Okay, so we've got a 10 minute intro. I haven't gone too much over time. I don't want to, to interrupt too much more, but I just wanted to say thank you everybody for actually submitting something, for taking time out of your busy schedules to present. I hope that you find some of these presentations really interesting today. We've got a few little breaks in the session that uh, Susan will tell you about in a moment, and just take that opportunity to go and say hello to somebody you've never seen before, or to ask them about something that they talked about in their presentation, because this is really what the symposium is about. It's about talking to other people, networking, building new friendships, sharing ideas. So thank you very much for coming. I'm sure there'll be a few people coming in and out throughout the sessions. That's not a problem. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to Susan just to go over the format for this afternoon. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much, Prof Carlson. We really appreciate uh, you coming today and being our kind of master of ceremonies. And we're excited for a great afternoon. Um, this is kind of our brief program. Hopefully you might have seen the, the longer version elsewhere. Um, but we are going to split the student talks into kind of three different categories. So for the undergraduate students, and that will be chaired by the fantastic Annie Kataki, our uh, local PhD student who's already been introduced. Um, after that, we will have a short break. Um, unfortunately, one of our keynotes had to drop out last minute as she's not well, and that this is unfortunately going to be a bit of a feature of the day. Uh, as you heard, we were virtual the last couple of years, and it's brilliant to be back in person, but we have had a slight bit of attrition last minute, so hopefully you'll forgive us on that. Uh, then we'll go into our postgraduate taught students, which I'll be chairing. Um, and then a fantastic keynote presentation from Professor Karinchi Gurusami, who many of you will know. Um, some slight attrition here in that Karinchi also isn't well, however, he was able to send a video of his talk, so we will air that today. Uh, and then we've got our postgraduate research student presentations, which would be chaired by the fantastic Katarina Pedersen. Um, and then into one more keynote presentation from Martin Farley about sustainability, which I'm really looking forward to as well. Again, some attrition here. I'm afraid that's a video as well. Apologies. Um, but I think, you know, all things considered, it's still great that we've got so many people in the room. Um, and I've seen the videos, so spoiler alert, they're great. Um, and then we'll go into our presentation of awards. In terms of the awards, you may have noticed that there's a couple that are People's Choice Awards. So there are Slido codes on screen here, and I'll remind you of them later. We're going to have a 15-minute Eurovision-style voting window at the end for you to rush and get your votes in. Whether you're in the room or watching us on YouTube, you can enter that Slido later in the day, and we'll flag when. Um, and that's it. So I'm going to pass over to Annie now to chair our first session. Thank you, Susan. A warm welcome from me as well. Um, I'm Annie. I will be chairing the undergraduate session for today. Um, just, uh, just a few clarifications before we start. There's not going to be um, any formal time allocated for questions at the very end, but we have loads of wonderful speakers today um, for uh, many different interesting topics. So please feel free to enable uh, discussion uh, about their presentations at our breaks. Um, I will give a uh, five four minute notice um, actually I'm gonna you have a, you know each one has a five minute uh, time allocated for your presentations and I will give you a notice when you hit, you hit your four minute mark uh, so please just keep an eye um, at me while you're delivering your presentation and please 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 do remember to um, keep as close to the microphone as possible for the purposes of all, all online streaming so yeah, we have lots of great presentations coming up, so let's get cracking. Um, I am going to invite uh, Lena Pack for the first presentation today. Lena, the stage is yours. So I'll start. Good afternoon. My name is Lena Pack, and I am in my third year of the bachelor's program studying medical innovation and enterprise. Um, I've always been interested in medical sciences and healthcare, and I'm interested in pursuing a career in this field. Um, my course has taught me the interface between healthcare innovation and commercialization. So um, that's what I've been uh, studying throughout my course. And in my free time, I enjoy playing the piano and listening to music. 
So to give you a brief overview of my project, um, currently the problem with cell culture is its use of large volumes of single-use plastics and animal-derived reagents. And matrigen rat tail collagen are among the most widely used reagents in cancer cell culture, where its use raises concerns regarding sustainability. Now, matrigel is collagen extracted from mouse tumor cells, where mice are intentionally bred in the laboratory and implanted with tumors for collagen extraction. Now, this is evidently, um, it raises a lot of concerns regarding sustainability, but there are also other well-known issues regarding um, consistency and lack of reproducibility. Matrigel was not available for my project due to worldwide shortages and also sustainability considerations in general. Now, rat tail collagen is extracted from rat tail tendon, and although it's typically extracted from animal remnants of sacrificed experimental cohorts when prepared internally by publishing teams, the source is unspecified by suppliers who undergo mass production. Marine organisms have been suggested as a sustainable alternative source, but there is a lack of commercialization that can be used in the lab. And among limited options, I have chosen jellyfish collagen, which is showing rising potential. Jellyfish collagen used within this project was extracted from a population of the Rhesusoma pomo jellyfish species that are harming its ecosystem due to its natural excessive bloom events that occur annually. Jello gels is clearly a more sustainable option, however it lacks evidence on its usability for cell culture, which is representing unmet need. This will be tested in my project, which makes my project novel as it is testing something new, and importantly, it will be evaluating the utility and risks of Jello gel prior to use in the laboratory. This brings me to my research question, can we use jellyfish collagen as an alternative to rat tail collagen cancer cell culture? So to give you a brief overview of my methodology, in my project I've completed 2D culture on flat plastic surfaces, as shown at the top of the slide, where plates were coated with a layer of collagen, either rat tail or jellyfish, and on top of which prostate cancer or LN cap cells were seeded. This is the most traditional method of cell culture that has been used by researchers for several decades. But recently, the emergence of three-dimensional cell culture has enabled a far more accurate representation of in vivo conditions. And cellular spheroids are an example of a 3D model that depicts the features of a solid tumor mass, which can then be utilized for tumor growth or metastasis modeling, and also a diverse range of therapeutic studies. Therefore, I completed 3D culture in addition to 2D, where Ellen caps spheroids, and I would like to give my credits to Michael Chu for growing the spheroids and developing a protocol for his project which I then used to embed in between two layers of jellyfish or rat tail collagen. Images of the spheroids are shown on the bottom of the slide. Now the results were compared to control where cells were embedded without the use of any collagen. And for endpoint analysis, several criteria, including cost, ease of use, time required, sphero growth rate, morphology, et cetera, were tested to prove null hypothesis, which means that there is no significant difference between the two groups. Now this will prove that jello gel is equally useful as rat tail collagen, which is currently used as the gold standard in cancer cell culture. However, it's more sustainable and therefore a better option. So far, it's quite interesting to see that a large portion of the results are actually rejecting the null hypothesis, which means that there is a significant difference between results. And um, for example, area of cells over time or 2D growth rates were greater in jellyfish collagen, whereas 3D spherical growth rates were greater in rat tail collagen. Further analysis must be done to kind of discuss and conclude my findings to see what it actually means. And former research is required to assess a wider scope of endpoint criteria to test the validity and safety of gel, gel prior to incorporation um, into, uh, into routine cell culture methodology. Finally, I would like to give a big thank you to Dr. Susan Hebe for guiding me and kind of supervising me throughout my entire project. I wouldn't have any of this without her, so thank you. Thank you very much, Lena. Next up, Ms. Supriya Potamatsi. Hello, so my name is Supriya Potamzetti, and I'm a third year medical student integrating in surgical sciences, and I had the pleasure of doing my project with our very own Dr. Susan Heavey. So just a little bit about me. When I'm not in the lab, I'm usually found in the gym or preparing for my half and half marathons and marathons, where I'll be raising money for various mental health charities. In terms of my research background, I did a case report on a rare type of breast cancer um, last term for a module for surgical sciences. And um, I've also done data collection for other projects as well. And the reason I'm doing this 
project itself is because I'm really interested in wet lab research um, and I wanted to gain more experience in the lab, which I don't usually get as a medical student, as well as gaining more experience in writing. Uh, so my plans for the future, I will hopefully graduate as a doctor. I'm really interested in research because of this project now and I'm looking into doing the PhD program at some point and I'm also looking into doing more business management and med tech things as well, which uh, thankfully medicine gives a possibility for. So my project is basically co-targeting something called BRD9 at NERG in prostate cancer cells. So what, what, do, what does this even mean? Like why am I looking at prostate cancer? So this is because prostate cancer survival has tripled over the last 40 years and survival is often dependent on uh, many factors including tumour staging um, and it's often reduced depending on the stage of cancer. So traditionally treatment um, is considered in the context of life expectancy and is often reduced um, dependent on the tumour diagnosis and treatment commonly involves surgery, radiation or hormone, ther hormone therapy. So such um, treatments are often invasive and associated with various side effects, including post-operative complications and long-term urinary and sexual effects, which wouldn't be great. Um, so although there have been improvements in t different techniques, um, poor outcomes are still associated with advanced forms of prostate cancer, um, such as developmental resistance to targeted treatments. So in such cases, a targeted treatment of BRD9 at ERG could come in some use um, along the clinical pathway for prostate cancer already. So a targeted treatment of ERG and BRD9 inhib inhibition could be used neoadjuvantly, so before surgery, in order to debulk the tumor, so make it smaller, um, as well as having a systemic effect on circulating tumor cells. Um, so that was a lot of terms right there, so just breaking it down, what is BRD9? So BRD9 is a recently discovered, largely unstudied subunit of a chromatin remodeling complex. So chromatin remodeling complex is basically a complex which modifies the chromatin architect architecture to allow gene um, to allow access to DNA for gene transcription. So for any like non-biologists out there, a way of thinking about this is if the chromatin is like a factory with different areas um, set in different different areas doing different jobs, but set in such a way that you can't do the job efficiently, the chromatin remodeling complex would be like a boss setting the areas efficiently to allow um, the jobs to be complete. So a paper released last year established BRD9 as a potential target for um, antigen receptor positive prostate cancer and a potential prognostic and diagnostic biomarker for prostate cancer. So the project I'm doing basically follows on from the previous work of Nafisa Barma last year, hypothesizing that BRD9 could be a promising target for prostate can cancer alongside other targets for which I'll be looking at ERG. So what actually is ERG? So ERG stands for ETS, erythroblast transformation specific related gene, and is basically an oncogene involved in regulating cell architecture, cell migration, invasion, and cell permeability. So it basically helps with the progression of cancer. Um, it's found to be overexpressed in a high proportion of prostate cancers and associated with tumor adv uh, advanced tumor staging. So my uh, project basically will be co-targeting these proteins, identify changes in prolifer cell proliferation and apoptosis through assays when treated in cells in 2D, and then identify whether BRD9 inhibitor with an ERG inhibitor is a promising um, treatment for future uh, to be investigated in patient tissue models. So looking at this, so looking at the omics data, um, there is a positive but weak correlation between um, ERG expression and BRD9 expression, which is why we looked at treating it in 2D cells, uh, cell culture. So uh, the gene network map is quite small over there, but the black dots basically represent different genes, and there were links between BRD9 and ERG, um, though not directly. There was, uh, they were connected via co-expression, physical, and genetic interactions. So my project basically involved culturing the cells and then treating them individually with each um, drug before doing a combination treatment and then looking at the effects through imaging, um, taking hundreds of images and anal analyzing them through imaging software to basically look at confluency, so the percentage coverage of the cells, um, and then using different stainings to see whether uh, the percentage of live and dead cells change depending on the treatment um, concentrations. Um, so the project is still ongoing, um, the research is, the re, uh, results are still in the process of being analysed, but hopefully we'll get some hope, uh, good looking data soon for that. Um, and I'd also like to say thank you for the project, uh, for Susan Hebe's help with this project. Thank you very much, Bria. So moving on with Bhavan Bathmaraj, the stage is yours.
Right. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bavin Pafmaraj, and firstly, I want to say hello to all you amazing people. Nice to see all your smiley faces out there. And, um, but I can't be, <laughs> to be honest, you know, enough about you, more about me. So who am I? So my name is Bavin, and I'm doing a surgical sciences IBSC currently, like Priya. And my passion for surgery and research has really been strengthened over the past couple of years. And I really want to do an AFP or even a PhD once I've finalized my chosen field of surgery. Now, uh, I don't really like talking about myself that much, but apparently I was forced to talk about my hobbies a bit. So, <laughs> in terms of my hobbies, to be honest, I really like entertaining, so, you know, as you can see, um, hopefully a big presence. But, um, and I've hosted a lot of charity events, and, uh, yeah, I've sang, danced, played the keyboard. And uh, one, of the main, one of the things that, uh, like, you know, in terms of my uh, accomplishments, I was part of the Children in New Car in 2013, and that's where I met my uh, role model, Sir Terry Wogan, um, one of the best uh, hosts out there and one of my major inspirations. And um, I also like presenting my research at conferences, and uh, I like teaching in my spare time as well, and I've helped a lot of students get into medical school in the past. So, again, like I said, not really like talking about me, as you can clearly see through the detail on this slide, but <laughs> moving on to my project, I want to focus on, well, I did a lot of stuff in my project, to be honest, and one part of my project is really looking at spatial transcriptomics. So, essentially, with spatial transcriptomics, what I wanted to understand was the specifically BRD9 gene expression in tumor versus benign regions of interest, as well as the relationship between the BRD9 gene and the angine receptor. So, firstly, what's spatial transcriptomics? Spatial transcriptomics is a very hot, hot topic now, considered nature method of the year 2020, and essentially can be used to measure gene activity, as well as map where that activity is specifically occurring. Another really, really hot topic currently in prostate cancer is BRD9. And BRD9 is a gene that's part of the GBAF complex, as you can see here, which is part of the Sweet Sniff complex. And essentially, what the Sweet Sniff complex is, so Priya actually described it quite well, it's a chromatin remodeler complex. So very simply, what that means is that it's, it can essentially um, control how much of the gene has access to transcription mechanisms and thereby controlling gene expression. And the reason why the Sweet Sniff complex is so, so important is mainly because of the fact that it has been shown to be involved in angine receptor mediated transactivation. And funnily enough, um, in prostate cancer, there are actually intact Sweet Sniff complexes, which means that you don't want there to be mutations for the prostate cancer to progress. So that's why, I, and yeah, that's the main thing with BRD9 and spatial transcriptomics. But currently, there are only two really major papers out there exploring BRD9 and prostate cancer. One paper is by Dr. Susan Heavey and her former IBSC student, Nafisa Barma. And they looked at sort of, they emphasized how BRD9 can be a um, prognostic and diagnostic um, biomarker in prostate cancer, especially in metastatic cancer patients. So that's something important to remember. And secondly, it was a paper by Alp Soe et al., another study group, conducted in 2019. And they showed that um, you can use sort of a BRD9 inhibitors to even target angine receptor gene expression. So that's something, of, that, that's, that's the reason why I want to explore the relationship between BRD9 and the angine receptor using spatial transcriptomics to see what is the specific link between them. So, if you can imagine, let's say you get one hot topic with spatial transcriptomics, you get another really hot topic with BRD9. So you get one hot topic and another hot topic. Combine them together, you should expect a massive explosion. So guys, hold your fire, fire, fire hats. Bang. So uh, yeah, as you can see, research is not as stellar as it, you know, as, as uh, I made it out to be, but here are some preliminary results anyway. So um, the first graph is a volcano plot. And this volcano plot really is just showing the significant distribution of the sweet sniff complex and the BET complex genes in tumor versus benign regions of interest. Now, um, unfortunately, when I looked at this data, my mind went confused and confuddled. Because if you look at this volcano plot, what's really weird is that the BRD9 gene, for some reason, is highly expressed in benign regions of interest. Now, Clearly, like I said before, that contrast was being said in the literature, you know, that it should be expressed in metastatic cancer patients. So um, there could be some limitations for that. And a couple of limitations could be, number one, is that um, we only had 10, sample, 10 patients, so the sample size might have been quite small, and se uh, when we inputted it into the spatial transcriptomics database. And secondly as well, um, in our tuberin regions of interest, there might not just be tumor, there might be some benign areas within those tumor regions, which might have sort of messed up our data a little bit. Um, secondly, we did a sort of PCA plot to show, uh, to show that there is a clear distribution in high versus low sweet sniff gene, re uh, gene expression in tumor regions of interest. So you can see a clear clustering of the high sweet sniff expression in one area and a clear clustering of the low um, sweet sniff expression uh, in terms of the gene expression profile. 
Now, what, in terms of future works, what I want to do is I want to look at the regions of high sweet sniff expression and see um, what genes can further be used as potential biomarkers. And just to quickly finish off, um, BRD9, as you can see through this gene map, there's four ways it can link to the androgen receptors through NFE2L1, PATG4, DAXX, and SPDEF. And this volcano plot shows that there's a high expression of androgen receptor as well as SPDEF and DAXX, uh, uh, SPDEF and NFE2L1, sorry, showing that BRD9 has a clear correlation with the androgen receptor in spatial transcriptomics. Anyway, thank you for my presentation. Thank you very much, Bavin. Moving on with Ryan Derner. The stage is yours. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Ryan. I'm currently studying for an integrated degree in surgical sciences. I work at the Pediatric Brain and Pituitary Tumors Research Group at Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health. And I'm supervised by Dr. Scott Haston and Professor J.P. Martinez Barbera. Um, so I'm a medical student, which means that I'm not particularly interesting. So I thought in typical medical student fashion, I'd use a slide to list some of my recent achievements and the work that I've been doing. Um, I want to draw your attention to what I'm doing currently. So the last two years I've been, uh, been working at Translational Psychiatry Research Group at UCL. In the last one year, I've been at the Pediatric Brain and Pituitary Tumors Research Group. So I'm interested in the brain, I'm interested in cancer, and how the nervous system might be implicated in uh, tumor aggression. So I have a few, uh, few scholarships, and I'm funded by the Pathological Society this year, so I want to thank them for their support. Uh, I also recently got accepted for the MBPhD at UCL, um, and if any of the academics want to um, discuss projects or funding, that would be brilliant. Um, other hobbies include mediocre sunset picture taking, uh, beer drinking, uh, and also running, but probably more akin to a brisk walk. Um, so let's talk about the science uh, and my project, which is investigating the role and exploitability of cellular senescence in pediatric brain tumors. So what is cellular senescence? Well, it's a state or a phenotype that can be induced in cells in response to damage or developmental cues, you see here. Um, and this means that there's an upregulation of cell cycle inhibitors. So the cells go into a state where they no longer divide, and this stops them from proliferating and prevents tumor progression uh, and, uh, and can carry on. And you can see in the, in the next diagram, there's a senescence-associated secretory phenotype. Um, this consists of pro-inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, and matrix metalloproteinases. This communicates with the immune system. It leads to the recruitment of, uh, recruitment of immune cells, which come into the tumor and clear these cells, so therefore offsetting tumor progression uh, and allowing for regeneration to occur. So it's good. It can have an anti-tumorogenic uh, anti effect. But if this uh, SASP or, uh, continues to accumulate and senescent cells accumulate, so if um, senescent cells uh, carry on accumulating, um, then it can lead to a chronic inflammatory state. And this is more permissive to tumor progression. And in this case, you can get cancer and aging. Uh, cancer and aging. Oh, you can't see it. It's gone. Uh, where's it gone? Ah! I'll go back. Um, sorry. It should be there. Got it. Got it? Got it? Yeah, got it. Yeah. Um, Sorry about that. Um, where was I? Yeah, so we're interested in exploiting this senescent state. Can we target these senescent cells with drugs that selectively clear them? These are called senolytic drugs, and they uh, can selectively clear these cells. And we're interested in this in two pediatric brain tumor models, um, these being medulloblastoma and diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. And why we're interested in these is because uh, in diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, children diagnosed with this tumor um, will invariably die within nine months. This is the median survival. So there's no effective therapies for these tumors. In addition to this, with medulloblastoma, 30% um, of children relapse. Again, this is invariably fatal. So there's a current need for uh, adjuvant therapies. So what we did is we recapitulated uh, in, uh, a chemotherapy regimen in, vivo, in vitro, uh, as you can see in the graph on the top left. Um, so we treated the cells with methotrexate, cisplatin, and cyclophosphamide and then wanted to quantify if we can induce senescence with the therapies. So as well as senescence being present in the natural pathogenesis of the disease, you can induce senescence with chemotherapy or radiotherapy regimens. So you can have a two-hit approach. You can clear the uh, senescent cells that you've induced with therapy, and you can also clear the cells that are present in the natural pathology. And so from the key PCR analysis after this uh, treatment regimen, we looked at cell cycle inhibitors and common hallmarks of senescence. So you can see the upregulation of P16 and P21, which are common cell cycle inhibitors, and then BCL family of proteins, BCL2 and BCLXL, which are anti-apoptotic factors. And also some interleukins and other hallmarks of senescence, as you can see in the top right. And you can see from the, the graph in the bottom right, 
there's a dose response between using senolytic drugs um, and, and uh, radiotherapy regimen in, in a DIPG model that was also uh, created by the lab. So there's a synergistic ablative effect. So you can use senolytic drugs in combination with uh, standard of care regimens to get rid of these senescent cells, which could potentially improve outcomes in these patients. And then finally, as you can see from the bottom left, um, we looked at the cell types and the markers that these senescent cells may be present in. So M. cherry is representative of senescent cells from our uh, genetically engineered mouse model, which co-localizes with CD68, which is a microglia marker. So as well as using adjuvant uh, senolytic drugs in combination with chemotherapy or radiotherapy, we could also target microglia, um, which may offset tumorigenesis, thereby improving the outcomes of these children. Um, so this, is, this work will hopefully form part of, a, uh, uh, part of the preclinical studies for a clinical trial at Great Ormond Street Hospital and hopefully improve the outcomes uh, for children with these brain tumors. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ryan. Just a kind reminder to everyone to give some love to the microphone here for our speakers, for our um, people, like everyone watching online. Next up, um, Tiara Rupesinga. Hi, everyone. Okay. So, hi, I'm Tiara. I'm also a third year med student doing my IBSC in surgical sciences. So, a bit about me I'm in New Cell Rowing, I'm an artist. Um, I recently helped organize the um, virtual academic surgical conference with uh, UCL Surgical Society. And I'm a part of a few um, national um, societies, including Make Medic and Medic Plus Club. And they're about like medical entrepreneurship, and Me Make Medic is a um, global medical charity. So, on to my project. So, what does the future of healthcare look like to you? What might come to mind is something like GPs being replaced by AI or Google being used to detect epi epidemics. Something that's already rapidly incoming is telemedicine. Telemedicine is a delivery of remote clinical services using tech, and it's thrived as COVID-19 has reduced clinical capacity and put patients off in-person visits. And this project, I have focused on medical wearables, specifically the Athera band, shown here, and it measures heart rate and step count. Although wearables have many more monitoring capabilities now, these two metrics are sufficient to measure post-op outcome for patients. More specifically, between 2008 and 2018, there's been a 580% increase in articles published containing the keywords wearable and heart rate. They allow unobtrusive remote and continuous data collection. Commercial devices are, however, expensive and require companion apps to work, so they're difficult to use at scale. The Athera Band is an inexpensive device which can measure heart rate and step count and does not require any third-party software and connects directly to your phone via Bluetooth. The main outcomes of this study is to see if the Athera band measures heart rate to a clinical degree of accuracy. Secondly, we also looked at the effect of band position on accuracy between the forearm and the wrist. And as another novel outcome, we also measured the impact of activity intensity and patient demographics such as BMI, gender, and hemoglobin levels on accuracy. So on to results. So we used C cardiac pulmonary exercise testing, or CPET, which is used in standard routine procedure for pre-op patients to measure the, their fitness to predict post-op outcome, with longer endurance on this bike correlated with better, better post-op outcome. So in summary, the patient alternates between periods of rest, um, periods of unloaded cycling, so this means cycling without resistance, and then a period of loaded cycling. So this is cycling with resistance, and they continue at this rate until they reach volitional exhaustion, which is when they're just too tired and they have to stop, and then they enter a cooldown period. So this shows, this graph shows the wearable wristband and the forearm wristband, and it's compared to a CPET ECG, and here it shows that they're all kind of quite accurate and similar to each other in their measurements. So this study was performed on 20 pre-op cancer, uh, cancer, it was performed on 20 pre-op cancer patients at UCH at West Moreland Street Hospital, and over 10,000 heart rate data points were collected over the course of the study. Overall, percentage clinical accuracy was 10% higher at the forearm and the wrist than the wrist, and this blander altman analysis is the gold standard when comparing medical devices, and it shows a lower mean difference, narrow la uh, limits of agreement, and less measurement error at the forearm. And concordance class correlation coefficient is used to show the strength of correlation between the ECG and the wearables, and it shows a strong correlation at the forearm and a weak correlation at the wrist. And all of these results show that, um, all of these results, sorry, um, oh dear, um, okay, so 
All of these results support the wearable being more accurate when worn at the forearm than at the wrist, and this is because it was sometimes hard to tighten the wearable strap at the wrist, which led to the band moving, especially during high-intensity exercise, which caused motion artifacts. And this meant the forearm wearable performed more consistently throughout varied activity intensities, as shown in this graph, unlike at the wrist. And the findings of demographic data was not conclusive because of the small sample size. However, this graph does show that the percentage clinical accuracy for women was 7.5% greater than for men, and 25% greater for BMI above 25 than below 25. So this study provides initial evidence to show that these devices are clinically accurate at measuring heart rate when worn at the forearm. And however, this study, um, a study with a larger sample size testing of day-to-day -day patient activity and wider patient demographic is required to validate these findings for clinical use. I hope this gives every one of us optimism about the future of healthcare and perhaps one day it will be our doctors contacting us in the event of a pathological heart rate or blood sugar readings from our watches rather than vice versa. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Sierra. Um, next up, Michael Chu. So hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Michael, and I'm a surgical sciences IBSC student working in Susan's lab at Charles Bellhouse. Um, so just a bit about myself. Uh, I'm a medical student, and this year I focused on doing research, and uh, so I've spent a lot of time in the lab and not much outside of it. Um, but prior to doing my wet lab research, I did a lot of work um, in clinical research at Westmoreland Street, um, and I've been presenting that research at conferences, and I've used that as an excuse to sort of travel around and stuff. But um, what I was really interested in doing this year was wet lab research, which I was kindly given the opportunity to do um, at Charles Bell House. So um, I'm actually thinking of maybe doing an academic foundation program in the future alongside my clinical studies. Um, so yeah, I really enjoy research so far. Uh, so what exactly is my project? Um, I'm working on culturing prostate cancer cells in 3D. Um, and Sort of, um, so I, I, at first I thought, you know, this is very easily attainable because I've seen 3D culture in a lot of other various cell lines. Um, but this was in practice not as easy as it seemed because um, it's in part due to the temperamental nature of the L and cap cell line and also in part due to um, the techniques required to generate spheroids. But why exactly am I culturing prostate cancer cells in 3D? Well, actually, um, 3D cell culture plays a role in bridging the gap between monolayer culture and also animal, animal models and in vivo culture. Um, so it's sort of, there's, there's been reports of um, cell aggregates in, in 3D culture which um, sort of expresses gene expression profiles similar to the tumor microenvironment in vivo. So this presents the opportunity for 3D culture to actually streamline the often long process of drug development and cell biology research um, by if more accurately evaluate, like, more accurately sort of, um, sort of evaluating sort of substance toxicity and efficacy. Um, the main bulk of my research involved optimizing and producing a standardized and reproducible protocol for um, cell generation in the LN cap cell line in, in, in particular. In particular. And um, in order to do that, I used 96 well ultra low attachment plates and made modifications to the sphero generation protocol, um, of which there's re relatively inconsistent literature on. Um, I then collected data on spheroid area and roundness primarily, and then I did subsequent uh, endpoint viability and proliferation assays. Um, I've also, nearing the end of my project, I've been working with um, students um, who've been targeting prostate cancer in 2D, and I've applied that to my 3D culture. And so, although I've been collecting that data very recently, I've not really analyzed the results yet. But provisionally, I can say that I've seen steroid area decreases, and I've also seen changes in cell morphology. So it definitely shows promise in, in um, taking part in, in sort of using 3D culture in sort of prostate cancer research. So I'd just like to reiterate, so, um, 3D models are very representative um, because they sort of are used in humans. They're, they're human prostate cancer sort of cells. So they definitely will play a role in the future, although in early development, 
they'll play a role in, in the future alongside animal models in, in prostate cancer cell research and cancer cell research overall. So thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Michael. Next up is Andrea Samudis, who is unfortunately unable to attend uh, in person today, but instead we have a recording of his presentation. Hi, my name is Andreas Samudis, and I'm a UCL medical student doing my IPSC research project in surgical sciences with Dr. Hirak Patra. Now, a little bit about who I am. I think one phrase that really sums up my character is that I love to make stuff. Now, this started from a young age. It started with wood carving, then it kind of shifted onto blacksmithing and anything else you could basically think of. But my true passion came when I made something to help people. When I made something for the person, and this was my Med Conceptions podcast. Um, this was a podcast dedicated to health literacy. Uh, you can find it on YouTube and Facebook uh, and Spotify. Um, and then I got involved in companies such as Healthy and not-for-profit organizations, which all had this thing in common, which was patient-centeredness. Um, and I found that surgical sciences gave me uh, this opportunity um, to get involved in creative solution uh, building for person-centered problems. And one such person-centered problem is the one that our friend uh, Fatima here is facing. Um, Fatima has corneal blindness. And like her, there's 12.7 million people in the world. And the only current treatment for this is donor transplantation. This still comes with its drawbacks. The main drawback being that there's a big shortage of corneas um, and such a big shortage that uh, Fatima has a 1.4% chance to get one. And this, this, uh, and this percentage stands, stands for the UK as well, uh, which is pretty shocking. And let's not mention the low but still significant risk of uh, rejection when having a transplantation. Now, because uh, of these drawbacks, the research in this, uh, in building artificial corneas um, is beginning to flourish. And one such solution for this is freeform 3D bioprinting. And this is a four step um, process. It starts with uh, scanning the patient's cornea, getting their personalized dimensions, importing those onto a computer, and then printing with the 3D printer using the patient's own cells the cornea and f in free form, which basically means um, we print without the use of a cast, we print directly what we measure. And uh, once we've printed the cornea, then uh, step number four is we transplant it back into the patient. Now this has several advantages. Uh, firstly, you have this personalization, like I've made this cornea, which has the exact dimensions of my patient's cornea. Um, it has also an a high efficiency in manufacturing, thus decreasing the cost of making them, and also gives us the, the chance and basically uh, opens up an avenue for the creation of a multi-cell and multi-layer cornea, which mimics the native, uh, the native cornea. So what we try to do is with the use of gelatin microparticles, we use this as a sacrificial medium. So as you can see here on the video on the right, you have the 3D bioprinter printing the fluid bioink inside these gelatin microparticles, which basically support this bioink until it is cross-linked. The bioink is cross-linked, UV cross-linked. Um, and then we melt away these gelatin microparticles, leaving behind the cross-linked corneal structure. And with this method, we were able to create this. This is uh, a gelma-based corneal structure. And we were able to create it with a 97.3% accuracy and a 0 0.1 millimeter precision. Uh, and this is to the dimensions measured and imported in the, in the computer. 
Now, uh, let me again highlight that this has not been done before. Um, and the next step for our project is to print with coronary keratocytes, epithelial and endothelial cells, um, thus achieving a multi-cell, multi-layer corneal structure. The first one, uh, to be exact. Um, and all this process we've been doing with Steps that are Cell Friendly. So it supports um, our next step. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, and if you have any questions, please do uh, drop me an email. Thank you. We have a couple of technical difficulties. We're back. Perfect. Next up, once again, Bavin, Bathmarage. The floor is yours. Oh, thanks. All right. Um, yeah, sorry, my evil twin stole my other <laughs> uh, presentation, so I'll be a bit more mellow in this one, don't worry. So my name is Bavin again, and um, as I said, I don't really like talking about myself, but I'll put the same slide up again. Um, so, um, yeah, as you guys know, I'm an IVSC surgical sciences student, really want to do an AFP and a PhD, and like I said, I really teched out like, all my hobbies, but um, we'll move straight on with the presentation with this one, because uh, this one's quite cool as well. So um, I did another project uh, with the division, and uh, we're focusing in this case in bariatric surgery. So the title of this project we're going to look at is Inoxaparin Venous Thromboembolism Prophylaxis in Bariatric Surgery. So before I explain the intro, let's just break down the title. So essentially what inoxaparin is, it's a low molecular weight heparin, which is essentially an anticoagulant. And in bariatric surgery patients, especially when you give anticoagulants, the way I like to define it is you need to give that sort of um, Goldilocks dose because you don't want to give too much because if you give too much, it will increase the risk of major bleeding rates. But you don't want to give too little because if you give too little, it's not going to be as effective and um, it, it, essentially the blood clots will still come about. So you need to find that perfect dose and that's essentially what we're trying to do at the Whittington Health NHS Trust. Currently, 13% of the global population are obese, which is quite a sad statistic to hear. And bariatric surgery remains one of the best ways currently to tackle obesity and obesity-related comorbidities. However, the major problems here are that surgery and obesity are major risk factors for developing venous thromboembolisms, i.e. blood clots. And there are no national guidelines currently to determine what is the best thromboprophylactic regimen in bariatric surgery patients. And the reason why I'm focusing on one low molecular weight heparin, in this case, enoxaparin, is because that's the current one being used in the Whittington Health NHS Trust, as well as other trusts associated with UCL. Interestingly enough, though, Parker et al. in 2015 answered a very similar question to identify the best enoxaparin dosing regimen. And they came to these three conclusions, which, were, which are going to be quite important later on to readdress. 40 milligrams twice daily of enoxaparin is preferable to 30 milligrams twice daily if it's used for just in-hospital patients. 40 or 50 milligrams once daily was enough for patients who would continue receiving thromboprophylaxis post-discharge. And enoxaparin was not advised preoptively because of the major risks uh, associated with uh, major bleeding. Therefore, what I wanted to do was essentially review the literature from 2015 to 2021 to determine whether the previous conclusions need to be updated in light of new evidence. So, essentially what I did, I con uh, what I did was conduct a standardised literature search identifying 101 papers from 2015 to 2021 on Medline and Embase using the same search terms as the previous paper by Parker et al., bariatric surgery and venous thromboembolism and enoxaparin. And after using the exact same exclusion and inclusion criteria as the previous paper, three studies were selected as the best available evidence to answer the clinical question, what is the best enoxaparin dosing regimen for bariatric surgery patients? So the first paper was by Goslan et al. in 2018. Now, Goslan had 36 patients in his control groups, and they had 31 patients in their study groups. The control group received 40 milligrams per day, and the study group received 40 milligrams twice daily. They measured different cases of DVT, so that's deep vein thrombosis, so the likelihood of developing blood clots in your uh, peripheral limbs, for example, as well as major bleeds. And they saw zero cases in both. So superficially, you might think, wow, you know, this is, both of them work really well. We don't really need to go any further. But there's a lot of limitations here. Because number one, the sample sizes are very small, only 67 patients. And that's not powered enough to detect a VTE rate of 1.9% in accordance with the literature for bariatric surgery patients. Secondly, the anaesthetist chose which patients went into which group. So therefore, the anaesthetist might have taken into account the risk factor profile uh, of each patient, introducing bias within these results. 
The second paper was by Rottenschweiker Town 2016. So they had a much larger sample size of about 3,500 patients in group one, 600 patients in group two. Group one received 40 milligrams of enoxaparin once daily during hospitalization. Group two, 40 milligrams once daily, one to four weeks post-discharge. They measured a variety of VTE, a uh, variety of different types of blood clots, and they saw significantly higher uh, increase in blood clots in the groups that, in the group that received 40 milligrams per day only during hospitalization, compared to those um, receiving enoxaparin one to four weeks post-discharge. But the major limitations of this study was that it was a retrospective study design, and that creates inherent biases in data collection, and thus there may be under-reported rates of um, certain types of VTEs within this data. The third study was by Javanier et al. in 2015. They had three groups of patients, so group one, 100 patients, group two, 100 patients, and group three, 200. Group one and two received 40 milligrams twice daily um, of enoxaparin, and group three received 40 milligrams once daily. Again, they measured blood clots and major bleeding rates, so zero cases of blood clots in all groups, but a significantly higher increase in major bleeding in group one and two that received 40 milligrams twice daily versus group three that just received 40 milligrams once daily. So, summarizing all the data in conclusion, the best enoxaparin dosing regimen, as you can see, is 40 milligrams once daily for one to four weeks post-discharge. Therefore, the previous conclusion needs to be updated um, and is incorrect. And in order to verify this, we can do a clinical trial with about 3,500 patients in each arm, comparing 40 milligrams once daily versus twice daily. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Melvin. Uh, next up, Annabelle Permit. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Annabelle Permit, and I'm in my third year of UCL medicine, studying for an IBSC in surgical sciences. So just as an actual brief introduction about myself, um, having spent a large proportion of my life participating in regional level sport, I've always been intrigued by sporting injuries and by the world of orthopedic surgery. Whilst at medical school, I've got as, evolved, as involved as possible spending the last three years shadowing and working with plastic surgeons at the Royal Free, and the last year shadowing and working with orthopaedic surgeons at both the Royal Free and Stanmore RNOH. So I've done a bit of research in, in the past, but the research project I'm going to present to you today, I carried out last term at the Royal Free with my two supervisors, Mr. Stamatio Samados and Mr. Akash Patel. So the project was about chronic quadriceps tendon rupture and the reconstruction using a combination of polytape and an Achilles tendon allograft, and it was a case report and a review of the literature. These injuries are fairly rare, with a prevalence of 1.37 cases per 100,000 patients per annum. Despite being relatively uncommon, they proved to be a debilitating injury that stopped patient from walking due to the disruption of the extensor mechanism. There is very limited literature on the reconstruction methods, and none of the current repair or reconstruction methods have been consistently successful in reinstating the function of the extensor mechanism. However, from reviewing the literature, we can see that the most common methods currently involve either the use of an allograft, an autograft, or an artificial graft. I've undertaken a case report on a 60-year-old gentleman with a right-sided, full-thickness, chronic quadricep tear which happened as a result of falling on his right knee with forced flexion. He presented in clinic in May 2021 with noticeable loss of quadricep muscle bulk and significant swelling. He could not attain a full straight leg raise or walk properly, so my supervisors carried out a novel surgical method consisting of a combination of an artificial polytape graft and an Achilles tendon allograft. Surgical management mainly followed usual procedures, including mobilizing the pro proximal quadricep tendon and muscle belly and advancement of the tendon, whereby the gap was originally measured at five to six centimeters in extension, but was reduced to two centimeters when the tendon edges were pulled distally towards the proximal pole of the patella. The Krakow technique was implemented through intraosseous patella tunnels. And finally, augmentation with the novel combination of the polytape and Achilles tendon allograft with the pulvertaft technique was carried out. And we can, if I go back a slide, you can see here that's when the augmentation with the grafts was done. The benefit of this combination, we believe, is the strength of the Achilles tendon allograft paired with the intrinsic strength, abrasion resistance, and lack of immune compromise provided by the artificial graft. The added strength of the two grafts together allows the repaired construct to act against tensile forces acting on the knee. 
As for our choice in grafts, there are several popular synthetic grafts, namely Marlex mesh, the Leeds Keo ligament, and the Neo ligaments polytape system. And they're all generally used for the reconstruction of the quadriceps and patella tendons, the rotator cuff muscles, and the ACL. The literature suggests that polytape may be superior to its counterparts, though, due to the highest rate of cell attachment one day post-implant of the scaffold, and this allows fast incorporation and success in the body. The main known limitation of polytape, however, is that due to being hydrophobic, it produces poor integration into the surrounding femur and patella bone tissue. However, researchers have actually found that a solution to this is a simple composite coating of 58S bioglass and hydroxyapatite, which can enhance osseointegration of the polytape in the bone tunnel. The fresh frozen non-eradicated Achilles tendon allograft is the most popular allograft choice for this surgery due to the sufficient thickness and robustness to repair the quadricep tendon. To our knowledge, this combination of the polytape art artificial graft and the Achilles tendon allograft has not been reported before in the literature. The method produced excellent results in our case report. The patient had a range of motion of five degrees of extension to 120 degrees of flexion, pain-free only six months post-surgery. We believe that the combination of the two grafts could lead to a more beneficial and structurally competent reconstruction, and the results of this technique are commendable provided a strict postoperative rehabilitation plan is followed, and we would advise all orthopaedic surgeons to consider this novel method of reconstruction in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annabelle. Uh, we're going to now take about a ten-minute break uh, before coming back for the rest of the presentations. Thank you all very much.
Okay, hi everybody, welcome back from the break. I think uh, you'll all agree that was a fantastic session from our undergraduates just now, so big well done to them. For many of them, it's their first time presenting research at an event like this, and for many of us, indeed, it's our first time presenting in real life for a while. So a big well done to everyone, you all did brilliantly. Um, now we're on to the postgraduate taught student session. Um, it's quite a, a long session. This is our biggest group of the day, and we've got a wide range of different topics. So it's going to be really, really interesting. Uh, again, I will borrow Annie's phrasing and ask you to give some love to the mic. <laughs> so those of you that are speaking, please bear in mind it doesn't have that wide of a range. So if you could lean in a bit like I am, it would be really appreciated. And without much further ado, let's kick off. Have we got Noor? Yes. Fantastic. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so as I was kindly introduced, I am Noor, and I am currently taking an integrated master's in medical sciences and engineering, and I'm doing my project with the Akbar group with Dr. Will Demaya. Uh, so firstly, a little bit about me. Uh, in my free time, I really enjoy painting, so these are a few of my paintings that I'm particularly proud of. Uh, as for my academic life so far, I was always really into maths at school, and I thought that's what I would study, but plot twist. I also like biology, so I studied medical sciences and engineering. Um, and specifically, I have an interest in immunology, so I decided to specialize in medical sciences. But my future plans would be to do a PhD in immunology and stay in academia. Uh, so about my project, I'm investigating the metabolic pathways in macrophage erythrocytosis. So it's quite a bit of jargon, so we'll dial it back a bit with something basic. Um, bee stings, you've probably all been stung by a bee at some point, and you'd remember the area can be quite painful, it's a bit swollen, it goes a bit red, that's inflammation. And inflammation is very useful uh, to prevent infections and get rid of all the stuff that you don't want to be there in your body, uh, but it's important to resolve the inflammation in order to repair the tissues in the surrounding area. And that's done by one of the immune cells called macrophages. So macrophages have an important role in the inflammatory process, but they also resolve it through a process called erythrocytosis, and that is the clearance of apoptotic cells. And it does that by surrounding the apoptotic cell, and then you can see from this diagram it ingests it, and then it breaks down the products. And once you've cleared that, you can have resolution. And it's a very important process, and despite that, it's not very well understood how it works. But what we do know is that it's impaired with aging and in certain diseases. So we can break my project down into three key questions. Number one, which metabolic pathways are upregulated or downregulated during erythrocytosis? So metabolism is one of those words where people think they know what it means, but quite simply, it's the way in which cells use nutrients to produce energy. And it is known that the metabolism in a cell affects its function. So you can see from this diagram on the right, metabolism can be split up broadly into cellular respiration or mitochondrial respiration, where cellular respiration is associated with a pro-inflammatory macrophage, and mitochondrial respiration is associated with an anti-inflammatory pro-resolving macrophage. Number two, does the inhibition of metabolism improve or impair erythrocytosis? So again, in this diagram in red, you can see three inhibitors. I've got 2DG and drug X, which I can't disclose the name of this drug. Um, they both target cellular respiration through a different mechanism. And oligomyosin inhibits mitochondrial respiration. And my final question is, how do these inhibitors affect metabolism in macrophages? So in my experiment, I'll be measuring the... Um, protein expression of the, these proteins that are quite important in metabolism and seeing how they change with the inhibitors. Sorry, I clicked the wrong side. <laughs> so my method can be summarized in this diagram. Um, so using blood samples, I isolate a particular white blood cell called the monocyte. I plate it with a growth factor called MCSF, and that helps them differentiate into macrophages. And you might remember these are the cells that I'm interested in. So by day eight, I'm confident that all my cells are macrophages and I can begin my experiment. And I have two different readouts. First one being the expression of proteins involved in metabolism. And the second one is erythrocytosis. That's after I've given my macrophages apoptotic cells and inhibitors. And I've got this diagram here so you can easily refer back to it as I'm walking you through my results. Uh, what, you, what you can see from this first graph is erythrocytosis does not affect cellular respiration. 
Um, but the next two graphs show that the proteins involved in meta, uh, mitochondrial respiration are upregulated upreg with epherocytosis, indicating a possible increase in mitochondrial respiration. And again, this is the anti-inflammatory phenotype. Uh, yeah, interestingly, both drug X and oligomycin, so both inhibitors, uh, significantly in, impair epherocytosis. Um, and that's quite interesting because I just mentioned that the protein in glycolysis or cellular respiration is not affected. Um, and none of these drugs have an impact on cellular respiration, and yet only oligomyosin seems to increase the expression of my protein, IDH2, in mitochondrial respiration. So overall, I've shown you that metabolism is affected by epherocytosis, and inhibiting metabolism significantly impairs epherocytosis, um, specifically mitochondrial respiration. And this just shows us that we are in the right area, that clearly this does have a big effect on function. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Noor. Perfect timing. Um, and I'd now like to welcome up Rumaz Sharif. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Rimaz Sharif. I am part of the Patra Lab Research Group, and today I will present my research project. Uh, but before I start, I will briefly introduce myself. So once again, I'm Rimaz. And I come from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. My journey in London started during 2017, where I did my undergraduate degree in biomedical engineering at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, during my second year, I did an internship, which helped me realize that I uh, would like to move more into the biological aspect of my degree. And uh, so in combination with my third year project and my interest in nanotechnology, I, uh, I I'm currently doing an MSc in nanotechnology and regenerative medicine at UCL. Um, for a few, as part of my future career goal, I would like to work in research and development. And outside of university, I am interested in cooking. And although I'm not a professional, I, like, I enjoy swimming and horseback riding. Um, moving onwards. Um, my project is about the development of lateral flow tests for early stage screening of pancreatic cancer. So pancreatic cancer was chosen particularly as it has one of the lowest survival rates in the US, occupying 11%. And the survival rate was found to be one out of four patients um, in the UK. Despite the huge efforts in improving the diagnosis using existing screening methods, an early stage detection remains a challenge. Um, this can be due to multiple reasons, including the nonspecific symptoms at early stages of pancreatic cancer. Hence, developing a rapid point-of-care lateral flow, for flow test for a patient is currently an unmet clinical need that can accelerate the, sc uh, the screening in clinical settings. Thus, the final overall aim of this project is to investigate and increase the selectivity, selectivity and sensitivity of lateral flow tests for regular screening and monitoring while preventing false positive and false negatives results. So as you can see, um, there are multiple stages in the project before achieving the overall aim. Currently, my project is investigating the initial proof of concept, which is to design and develop a lateral flow test based on carbohydrate antigen levels in the blood. Although there is currently a lateral flow test that detects the presence of the cancer antigen, my aim is to increase the sensitivity and selectivity of the lateral flow test by the addition of test lines to, present, uh, to represent the levels of the antigen uh, rather than just give a negative or positive result. The initial stages of my methodology involves optimizing the appropriate golden nanoparticles for their functionalization with different um, concentrations of MSA and PEG to get the best immunoassay. Different characterization uh, methods include UVVs, NTA, and DLS will be conducted uh, to the MSA and PEG uh, golden nanoparticles to observe the stability of the nanoparticles at different concentrations applied to the six different sizes. Um, the optimum size and concentration will be um, either MSA or PEG will be selected. Um, and then moreover, I will, the monoclonal antibodies will be conjugated onto the selected nanoparticles. Um, consequently, freeze drying procedure will be conducted to ensure that the antibody sensitivity and reactivity is retained when in the dried state and the rehydration or rewetting state. 
And uh, lastly, I will be in the fabrication and the optimization uh, state of my project, which involves optimizing the sensitivity and the limit of detection for the LFT. Thank you for listening. Hope you know. Well done, thank you again. Now we have Kegla Erdas. Thank you. And I'll just ask you again, like everyone, keep the microphone nice and close if you don't mind. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I am Chala Erdas. I am doing Master of Science in Nanotechnology and Regenerative Medicine and working with Gavin Strauss Research Group for my research project. Um, before we go on, I'd like to explain briefly myself. I am from Turkey, and I have a small family with my parents and little sister. I love painting natural places and animals. These are some of my paintings. Uh, previously, I graduated medical school and in Turkey and worked as a GP and pediatrician. After my clinical experience, I interested in regenerative medicine to find more curative solutions and uh, explore new aspects. For my research project is generally related to nanoparticles. Nanoparticles are a great tool as drug carriers and for diagnosis. We can tune their size and they can interact with biological systems. Uh, in our project, we will use gold nanoparticle because they are useful for uh, drug carrier and uh, as drug carrier and uh, their surface plasma resonance help us to use them uh, for targeting purposes and uh, imaging purposes, also uh, cancer treatment. Uh, their surface plasmonon, uh, their, uh, their strong surface, sorry. Uh, their surface, uh, their strong surface binding affinity useful for active targeting. When nanoparticles enter into biological fluids, water and protein interactions happen, and over time, nanoparticles are surrounded by proteins, which is, which is called protein corona, and relatively the inner layer is called heart protein corona, and the outer layer is called soft protein corona, which is interaction with the environment. And protein corona determines the biological identity of the nanoparticles and communicate with the cells and systems. Immunoglobulins are the one of the 10 most abundant protein in human serum. And uh, literature showed that 15% of the protein corona made up immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins are functional proteins and they can act as an opsonin. Uh, and also literature showed that in the decrease of or absence of immunoglobulin in protein corona, nanoparticle uptake decreases. They also suggested that the interaction between protein corona complexes and immune cells happen via FC receptors. This is the receptors on uh, immune cell membrane. Actually, the problem is the efficacy of targeted nanoparticles is just only 0.7%, and clearance, distribution, toxicity, cellular interaction of the uh, nanoparticles are still unclear. On the other hand, protein corona formation can change according to serum types. Even uh, the patient profile, age, illnesses can alter it. Therefore, we need better understanding about the role of specific uh, proteins specific proteins, especially immunoglobulins, in the protein corona formation for establishing better in vitro models and medical translations. In our project, we hypothesized the absence of immunoglobulin will affect the gold nanoparticle protein corona complex size, charge aggregation profile, 
as well as protein coronal compositions. To prove this hypothesis, we will firstly look at the uh, soft corona formation by using nanocyte and UVs, and then we will analyze uh, the hard corona formation by using TM and DLS. And then finally, we will analyze the hard and soft pro protein corona composition by using uh, LCMS. And then we think that gold nanoparticle incubated in immunoglobulin deficient human serum and normal human serum will elicit different cellular uptake profile. To show this qualitatively, we will use TM, and for quantitative analysis, we will use ICP-OAS. And then we think that uh, cellular, we think that the effect of gold nanoparticles uh, protein corona on cell uptake is immunoglobulin dependent via FC receptors. To show this, uh, we will first block FC receptors and then use same quantitative okay. and qualitative analysis and then do some cellular tests. <laughs> yes. I'm so um, sorry. No problem. <laughs> but well done. That was excellent. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> That was excellent, thank you so much. And I'm sorry for being really strict on time, but just trying to keep it fair for everybody. Uh, next up, we have Aditya. Fantastic. Thank you. And just as with everyone, please stay nice and close to the mic. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming out today. My name is Aditya Sharma, and this is my presentation. <coughs> So a little bit about myself. Uh, this is what I like to do. Uh, enjoy beautiful views like that. Um, in, my in, my, in my spare time, I also like to play chess, uh, tennis, all kinds of winter and summer sports, uh, as well reading and uh, traveling. Um, I'm, inter I'm interested in combining um, entrepreneurship in medicine, possibly doing an MBA in the foreseeable future, um, and utilizing advanced medical technology uh, for improving patient outcomes and um, aiming to achieve excellent patient outcomes. I know that's incredibly hard to do, but uh, that's what I like to think about. So my background is um, I've completed a doctor in medicine uh, in Poland, where I uh, practice as an FY1 intern currently in Poland. Um, and the reason I joined this master's at UCL was because I wanted to gain more hands-on experience um, and improve my, improve my surgical skills as well as get involved in uh, research. Um, my aims for the future is to complete the foundation training uh, in the UK, um, possibly uh, pass the MRCS exam and become the uh, member of the society as well as um, specialize in surgery. So the, my topic was, um, the topic of my research project was um, the importance of socioeconomic factors in the disparity of outcomes for uh, abdominal aortic aneurytic patients. Um, and we, did, uh, we evaluated uh, outcomes in three measures, and that was uh, mortality uh, following surgery, um, attendance to um, screening uh, for abdominal aortic aneurysms, as well as um, follow, um, attendance to follow-up recommendations. Um, and so, we attempted to um, assess individuals, um, a, a cohort's uh, socioeconomic status, either by their um, income, uh, martial status, education, employment, health, accessibility to healthing and um, services, um, quality of living and envir environment, just to name a few, because um, socioeconomic status is a very vast concept and, in, and involves many, many, many different aspects to, uh, in fact, render somebody uh, de facto uh, social economically deprived. Um, and so uh, it is important to note that these specific populations that are social economically deprived are two to three times more likely uh, to develop abnormal aortic aneurysms. Um, and so uh, we searched to large beta databases, which were um, Medline and Embase, um, based on very specific inclusion and exclusion PICO criteria and that allows us to identify over 1,041 articles 
only 33 of which were included in the final analysis. Um, and we found that deprivation in terms of income, ethnicity, race, education, primary barrier status, um, houses in poverty and health were associated with increased odds of mortality and deprivation in terms of um, the various deprivation indexes that were utilized in the studies that were included in this um, project. Um, in terms of income, health, martial status, employment and health and education were also linked to uh, decreased uptake of screening. However, we weren't able to uh, find uh, data with uh, significant data that would allow us to uh, say the same thing about uh, uh, attendance to follow up. So that would be um, the gross highlight of, of my uh, research. Uh, I think it is imp incredibly important to recognize specific risk factors so that um, interventions can be implemented to target a specific uh, populations at risk. Thank you. Thank you very much. So our next two presentations are by video. The first is from Jack Gorard. So. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. My name is Jack Gorard and I'm one of the master's students currently studying on the Surgical and Interventional Sciences course. Um, I'm currently working my thesis at the Griffin Institute, which is a charitable research institute who specialise in training the next generation of medical professionals with novel and translational treatments. So my supervisors are Professor Nada Francis, who's a colorectal uh, consultant surgeon and is director of training at the Griffin Institute and also uh, being supervised by Mr. Matt Boll, who's a surgical research fellow who's completing a PhD uh, at the Griffin Institute. So who am I? So I was born and grew up in Ealing, West London, and I'm part of a very large uh, family, as you can see from the middle photo. Um, so despite having three older brothers, my sister was definitely lo loudest in the household. Um, I studied medicine in Nottingham, and then stayed there for two years afterwards to complete my foundation training. And I'm hoping to become a colorectal surgeon for the future. So in terms of my hobbies, I enjoy adventurous holidays, as you can see from the picture in the top right, um, of climbing to uh, Everest Base Camp. And I'm also a very keen runner. The title of my project is The Application of Objective Clinical Human Reliability Analysis, abbreviated OCRA, assessing generic robotic surgical skills during training. So robotic assisted surgery has tremendously grown in the last 15, 20 years, uh, mainly due to the robotic uh, machines having improved vision with them being 3D, uh, greater freedom of movement with robotic arms being able to move 720 degrees, and better ergonomics for the surgeon. However, despite this rapid growth, there is no uh, global standardization for robotic surgical training and uh, the training varies greatly between different trusts and different hospitals and there's no baseline that you need to achieve before you're deemed competent in using the robotic surgical machine. So this would uh, impact the patient safety and effective training. Effective and validated assessment tools have the potential to improve robotic surgical training as trainees are able to uh, get feedback on where areas they need to improve and also are able to guide, uh, it can also serve as a guide of how far they are progressing along their training. So OCRA has the advantage compared to other uh, assessment tools as it's able to not only just say an error has occurred, but it's able to identify how the error has occurred and the consequence of the error. So this is the first study uh, applying OCRA to robotic surgical tasks. And in the future, we hope uh, uh, OCRA can be applied to uh, robotic surgical operations in the operating room. And the ultimate aim is that this OCRA methodology can be incorporated into the robotic machines and they can be able to provide immediate feedback and uh, uh, be able to give feedback more often, thus improving the surgical trainee training and thus improving uh, surgical uh, patients' outcomes. 
14 participants attended a five-day intensive robotic skills course and basic robotic skills um, were assessed in uh, VR and on dry models using the da Vinci robotic surgical machines. A total of 224 videos were recorded for video analysis. And scores for each cask were obtained using gear scores, our newly developed OCRA methodology scores and automated VR scores. So gears and automated VR scores have previously been validated for basic robotic skills. We developed uh, a new uh, OCRA methodology specifically for general robotic skills. So OCRA is a manual human assessment methodology um, whereby each task within the procedure undergoes video analysis for detection, categorization and consequences of errors. It has previously been validated for um, laparoscopic surgery. So the uh, reliability of our, of our new OCRA uh, methodology will be assessed in two ways. So firstly, the inter-rata um, uh, reliability will be assessed uh, by comparing again, two assessors to compare scores and to see if they get the same results. The intra-rata reliability of OCRA is assessed by the same assessor, um, uh, assessing scores at two different points in time. So our newly developed uh, OCRA methodology um, will also be compared to, compared to the gear scores and the automated VR scores to assess its validity. So for those in the room, we just need to wait a few seconds for the stream to catch up. You're not next, I'm afraid. <laughs> Hello, I'm Maria, and I'm currently in my fourth year of medicine. Hello, I'm Maria, and I'm currently in my fourth year of Okay, our next talk is from Maria, and she also unfortunately couldn't make it today, so this is another video. Thank you very much uh, to Maria for sending this in. Hello, I'm Maria, and I'm currently in my fourth year of medical sciences and engineering. I'm part of Gavin Jill's research group, and I'm supervised by Asada Rizé and Gavin Jill. I'm sorry I can't be there with you today, but I hope you enjoy my presentation nevertheless. So, who am I? I'm originally from Spain, but I moved to the UK to study at UCL. So here's me on my first day of uni. Uh, I chose my degree because I enjoyed all um, scientific disciplines, so biology, chemistry and physics, and I didn't want to leave any of them behind. And I'm happy to report that I have touched on all of them in my degree. So while at uni, I uh, found a passion for salsa dancing, and I even got to participate um, in some national competitions. This past year, I joined uh, Gavin Gels Group, where I embarked on a research project that I will share with you today. I truly enjoy research, and I would like to continue this um, into the future. Okay, so now onto my research. Over the past six months, I've been exploring the role of boron, silicate, and cobalt bioactive glasses on bone in vitro. The reason we're conducting this research is that impaired bone healing um, remains amongst the most prevalent clinical challenges, especially amongst the elderly and the diabetics. Biomaterials like bioactive glasses have shown promise to induce bone regeneration by being able to release ions like silicate or boron in a controlled manner. But what am I contributing to the field of bone tissue engineering? Firstly, this research will um, further understanding on how boron, silicate, and cobalt bioactive glass ions affect biomineralization which is the formation of extracellular mineralization collagen. Secondly, we aim to establish a quantitative multidisciplinary characterization approach, which will allow us to understand the differing effects of these ions on biomineralization. To undertake this research, we used a primary osteoblasts, which are bone forming cells from rats. We cultured these cells um, for different timeframes under various conditions, which include boric acid, which is a standalone boron ion, boron bioactive glass, sodium metasilicate, which is the standalone silicate ion, silicate bioactive glass, and cobalt bioactive glass. We first characterize the bone using an alisarin red stain, which allows us to look at calcium deposits within the cells. So using a Python script, 
um, the total area covered by the stain was calculated. And what we found was that silicate bioactive glass showed the highest biomineralization. And as you can see from the stained images, this is apparent to the naked eye. We also found that boron bioactive glass uh, with boron concentrations at 0.5 millimolar uh, significantly increased biomineralization. However, boron bioactive glass um, also contains silicate ions. Therefore, it's possible that um, the silicate component within the bioactive glass is responsible for this positive effect on biomineralization. We also characterized the bone um, through interferometry, which um, is where bone nodule height can be evaluated. These results again showed that silicate bioactive glass um, with uh, silicate concentrations of 0.5 millimolar led to the greater peak to valley, so the difference between the lowest and the highest point um, in the bone nodule. This is indicative of taller and bigger bone nodules, which you can see in the images on the right. So to further characterize bone nodule formation, we will evaluate um, angiogenic responses, as well as the ultrastructure and the chemical composition. No publication to date has characterized the effect of silicate, boron, or cobalt bioactive glass simultaneously, uh, making this research essential in the advancement of bone tissue engineering to help the healing process in the elderly and the diabetics. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much again to all our virtual speakers. Hopefully, you, um, if those of you are well and free, you've been watching us on YouTube, in which case you've gotten great re uh, reception in the hall and lots of applause, so well done. Um, our next real life speaker is Ibrahim and he is here and ready to go. The floor is yours. Hi everyone, um, my name is Ibrahim. I'm doing the MSc in Surgical and Dimensional Sciences with the Pereira Sado Lab. My supervisor is Zainab Rai and Pilar Sado. Um, so a little bit about me, I was born in Saudi Arabia back in 1995, um, raised in Lahore, and then for whatever reason my parents decided to move us to Preston in Lancashire. Um, I was very happy to move down to London to study medicine at St George's, which in my opinion, despite what the rankings say, is the best medical school in the world. Um, I did my F1 and F2 uh, junior doctor jobs in Colchester which was great. I developed an interest in surgery, applied for core surgical training, which I'll be starting this uh, August. Um, and I, in the meantime, I'm doing this MSc. Uh, in terms of the future, I'm an aspiring um, hepatopancreatobiliary surgeon. I want to do transplant surgery as well. I'm a long-suffering Arsenal fan, but yesterday's result helped. Um, and I'm a cricket fan as well. Um, I play cricket regularly for my local cricket team. And that's a nice picture of my mom and my dad with me. Um, in terms of my project, so going on with my interest in having a career in hepatopancreatobiliary surgery, I chose this project. So evaluating the role of irreversible electroporation in the treatment of pancreatic cancer. As many of you may know, pancreatic cancer is one of the deadliest cancers um, known to mankind. It's got terrible outcomes. Five-year survival is less than 3%. Um, since the 1990s, um, the incidence has increased 17%. So there's a really big need to develop new ways and, and innovative ways to treat pancreatic cancer. Irreversible electroporation is a novel ablative therapy um, that can be used with the treatment of pancreatic cancer. And essentially, it uses high voltage um, electric current to destabilize the cell membrane. Um, and um, initiate apoptosis or necrosis. Um, so essentially what I've been doing is using established cell lines, um, um, various uh, like, like PANC1 and CFPAC, um, and also normal cells from the pancreas, um, electroporating them using the electroporator at various um, field strengths, uh, various using different um, pulse numbers, length of uh, treatment and duration of treatment. Um, after electroporating them, we're culturing the cells for up to uh, 96 hours in 96 well plates. Um, we're doing toxolite, live dead stains, MTT assays uh, to evaluate cell death and prolif proliferation rate. 
We're also going to, in the future, uh, validate our data using flow cytometry and fluorescence microscopy. Um, in addition to just electroporating the cells, we're also going to be treating these cells with calcium chloride and other cytotoxic agents to find out if a synergistic approach can be used to treat pancreatic cancer and try to find out the optimal combination therapy. And if I have time, um, we've been getting some patient-derived cells from actual patients uh, from theatres, and we're tr going to try and culture them as well and uh, electroporate them and see how our data um, compares to the established cell lines. Initial results have been very promising, so increasing the voltage strength has also um, increased um, cell death and decreased cell proliferation rate. Um, the EC50, or the half maximal um, effective voltage strength, was around 850 volts per centimeter. Um, also, increasing the pulse number has reduced cell proliferation and increased cell death. Um, yeah, that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, our next speaker did have to pull out, so we're skipping one ahead now to uh, Patricia Perez Gonzalez. Uh, welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. As I said, just keep close to the mic, please. <laughs> Thank you. So, hi everyone. Um, I'm Patricia, and my research project, which is 3D in vitro modeling of a diabetic wound, is a collaboration between the Griffin Institute and UCL. My supervisors are Dr. Ferdinand Lally and Dr. Prasad Sawarka. And well, a little bit of myself. I am from Mexico. I have a bachelor in medicine. Uh, and currently I'm studying the master's in nanotechnology and regenerative medicine here at UCL because I really like the idea of being able to innovate within the field through research and hopefully being able to create something that will have a significant impact in people's health. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I, I really like the project that I'm doing. And also, um, well, I like to discover London through running. You can see me here very happily running a half marathon, which was hard. Um, and also, I enjoy singing and performing, and currently I am a member of a musical theater group. Um, and if you like it, uh, we will have a show in summer, so you can ask me later on. Um, and talking about the project, which is 3D in vitro modeling of a diabetic wound, uh, diabetic foot ulcers are very common in diabetic patients. Uh, and what happens here is that the high glucose levels damage developed vessels and the nerves, and that makes the wound to remain open and be susceptible to infections. Um, and talking about the wound healing process, the normal healing process versus the diabetic one is really different, mainly because in the diabetic wound healing, uh, there is an increase of uh, inflammatory macrophages and pro-inflammatory cytokines, as you can see in here. There's also an angiogenesis that will promote a hypoxic state. And there's also an increase in apoptosis of fibroblasts and keratinocytes that is going to uh, delay or avoid the formation of the granulation tissue. So basically what happens is that because of the macrophages, there's a persistent inflammatory stage that uh, avoids the formation and the closure of the wound. And that makes it susceptible for infections. So if we take into consideration that, for example, here in the UK, around 10% of the patients that have diabetes will develop a, a foot ulcer, which will translate around like 450,000 patients every year, and that once they have the ulcer, up to 50% will die within five years, and once they have the amputation, they, up to 80% will die within five years, five, year, five years, sorry. It's really important to have models or, uh, yeah, basically models to, so where we can study this and use these models to develop therapies. And the 3D models, well, in generally the in vitro models have uh, the potential to be an important source of, of models to be able to create these therapies. We have 2D models and we have 3D models. Basically, 2D models only incorporate one type of cell, and the most common is the scratch assay. And the 3D models incorporate two different cell types. Uh, the most common are uh, incorporating keratinocytes and fibroblasts or uh, using only endothelial cells. And they are really important because the, with this, we also would not be using animal models, and we'll be using also the 3Rs for uh, doing this research. Um, 
And so with this research project, we're trying to answer the research question to see if we can mimic the diabetic wound environment by exposing the cells to hyperglycemia. For the methods, basically what we're going to do is we're going to use collagen, type 1 collagen uh, as a matrix. Then we were going to seed human-derived fibroblast. On top of the uh, fibroblast, we're going to seed keratinocytes. And then we're going to do a punch biopsy to uh, mimic the creation of the wound. And then we're going to co-culture induced monocytes. We, we will be using THP1 cell line, and we will uh, tran transform the monocytes into macrophages, pro-inflammatory macrophages. Uh, and all of this will be done while we culture the model in normal glucose media and uh, high glucose media. And with this, if it works, we will be able to have a model uh, in which we will be able to investigate the effects of hyperglycemia and inflammation in this 3D model and hopefully be able to use it as a uh, therapy testing. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And moving on now to Aisha as well, if you'd like to join us. Uh, and just a brief thank you as well to everyone for keeping so well to time. I know it's really tricky in such a short uh, time, but you've done really, really well. Thank you. Hi, my family's on the live stream. Hi. Um, <laughs> um, my name is Aisha, and I'm on the Nanotechnology and Regenerative Medicine Masters. I'm doing my project with the Patra Lab, and that's us having coffee together. My supervisors are Dr. Alex Chibu and Hirak Patra. So a little bit about myself. I'm originally from Pakistan, and I lived in Hong Kong briefly before moving to the UK to do my undergrad in cellular and molecular biology. I had had enough of like protein folding and cell signaling, and I wanted to go into something more translational, so I started this master's in nanotechnology and regenerative medicine. Um, my life outside of university, I go swimming, and I go boxing, and I make everyone's birthday cakes. So if your birthday's coming up, let me know. Um, for my life after university, I want to remain in medical research, and I want to go into uh, translatable medical sciences, things like implants, devices, something like that. Not really sure yet. We'll see where that goes. So a little bit about my project. Um, my project is a pro-regenerative, anti-infectious, collagen-based corneal implant, and the goal here is that we make a corneal implant made of collagen that is designed to replace human donor corneas during corneal transplantation surgeries. Um, the transplantation is an option for um, end-stage corneal disease and injury where there is no other option. You can only regain your sight by getting a corneal transplant. But as always with any type of organ transplantation, donor shortages have resulted in only one in 70 patients actually being able to access um, the corneal transplant when they need it. There was some initial clinical um, trial success with this project, um, but the implant that was used was a very simple one and it needs further personalization because there were issues with infection and inflammation that resulted in some rejection. So the aim of this project is to create a collagen-based corneal implant that can be transplanted and embedded into the patient with good optical clarity and it is embedded with anti-infectious drug nanosystems to protect the patient. So my methods are divided into three sections. The first section is the biomaterial, where we source our collagen from an animal source of tendon. We extract this, analyze it, make sure it has good optical clarity, because no point putting a collagen into someone, if, uh, a cornea into someone, if you can't even see through it. The second stage is the drug nanosystem. So we make two uh, drug nanosystems. The first one is an antiviral. The second one is an antifungal. And with this, we target the two most common types of eye infections that we see in the clinic, which are uh, herpes infections and the candida infection. So this is kind of the personalization here. We have these patients who are susceptible to infection, and we are preventing it from happening in the first place by embedding the cornea with these um, drug systems. Um, the future work here are regenerative potential studies. So what we want to see is that are our corneal epithelial cells actually able to grow on this biomaterial that we've made? Um, is our drug nanosystem toxic to these cells? Are the epithelial cells able to form an epithelial layer once we transplant them? Because this implant is acellular, so we're relying on the material itself to be kind of like a favorable environment for the cells to grow. And we are also going to be doing uh, drug studies to see the toxicity of the drug on the cells separate from the collagen. 
and in the end, the goal for this project is it's a smaller it's a smaller part of a larger toolbox, and this larger toolbox will be able to create personalized implants for patients according to their needs. So if we have a patient who has herpes already, as you know, 70% of the population has herpes. If we have a patient who already has herpes, we can give them an antiviral cornea to begin with, preventing infection in the first place. There are also other side projects and toolboxes um, that are being made for infection, vascularization, things like that. Uh, thank you. That's it. <laughs>
Thank you very much. And next we have uh, Jenny. Welcome. And uh, the floor is yours. I think we are finally at our last presentation. Um, so well done for sticking through. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jenny Pratita from the Surgical and Interventional Sciences MSc program. As the last speaker of this session, I hope the committee was aiming to save the best for the last. My supervisors are Professor Jenny Sui and Dr. Ranjana Rai from UCL and Dr. Elisabetta Rosalini from University of Pisa, Italy. So my background is a first year cardiothoracic and vascular or CTV surgery trainee from Indonesia. And considering how expensive a master from UCL is, I wouldn't be here if, if it wasn't for the achievement scholarship that I received from the British government. So Indonesia is the world's biggest archipelago with 253 million population. However, we currently have less than 200 city surgeons, meaning one surgeon is responsible for 150,000 people. As these surgeons are too busy serving patients, most are not able to pursue a research career or education. And the lack of research leads to the underdevelopment of this field in Indonesia. Therefore, I joined this program in the hope of becoming an exceptional clinician researcher who will be able to push forward this field in Indonesia. Moving on to my project. Cardiovascular diseases, or CVD, is the world's number one killer, accounting for one third of all global deaths. Most CVDs involve the process of atherosclerosis, which is the narrowing of blood vessels due to fatty plaque accumulation. And as a result, your organs won't get enough oxygen or nutrients. If this happens in your heart, you will experience chest pain or heart attack, which all of us know is little. If it happens in your legs, you're first going to feel pain while you're walking, which might not seem like much, but you could ultimately lose your toes or even your limb. For these cases, the ultimate treatment would be surgical bypass, where the patient's own vessels is used to bypass the narrowed blood vessels. Unfortunately, only one third of all patients have vessels suitable for grafting. And although there are already several synthetic materials established for vascular grafts, such as PTFE and Dacron, when used to replace uh, vessels with small diameters, such as those in your heart and your legs, their patency is still much lower compared to the native vein graft. One of the causes of the low patency is clotting due to the lack of endothelialization. So basically, just like the native artery, the graft surface needs to be covered by a layer of endothelium to prevent clotting. And in the, in the body, endothelium is formed by endothelial cells, which originates from the endothelial progenitor cells, or EPC. And fibronectin is one of the molecules that could increase not only EPC adhesion to the graft, but also their differentiation into endothelial cells. Therefore, we came up with the project Biodegradable Small Diameter Vascular Graft, or SDVG, with fibronectin recognizing molecularly imprinted particles, or MIP, for in situ endothelialization. So the biodegradable SDVG from polycaprolactone-based polymer has previously been developed by my supervisors at UCL. It has a fibrous structure which mimics native artery. We will equip the inner surface of this SDVG with fibronectin recognizing MIP from the University of Pisa. These particles will capture uh, and bind to fibronectin and enrich the SDVG surface with fibronectin, hence improving endothelialization and patency. There are three parts of the project. Currently, we are on the functionalization uh, of the SDVG with MIP. Uh, we are doing it by dripping MIP-containing solution on the SDVG. Afterwards, we would like to see if the functionalization affects the characteristics of the SDVG by performing extensive characterization, including morphological and microstructural, chemical, mechanical, as well as thermal characterization. We will also assess the degradation rate of the functionalized SDVG and its ability to recognize and selectively binds to fibronectin. The final part would be cell study using endothelial cells from the human umbilical vein or HUVAX. We are hoping to see good growth and proliferation of functional HUVAX on the functionalized SDVG. That is all for me. Hopefully you are all as excited as I am to soon have a readily available vascular graph for CVD patients with good patency. Thank you all for your kind attention.
thank you so much. So that's the end of our postgraduate tour session. A huge well done to everyone. Again, I know it's a bit um, out of our comfort zone right now to come back to the real world and present. We've all been on those Teams screens for quite a while. Um, and you all did absolutely fantastically. For those of you who sent through videos, thank you for still taking part, even in difficult circumstances. We hope, if you can, you're enjoying it from home. Um, and yeah, just finally, one more big round of applause for all our speakers, because I think you all did a really brilliant job. So as you can see up next, we have Professor Karinchi Gurusamy. We're really lucky to have a great talk from him on a really important topic. Um, this is one that's really important to Professor uh, Gurusamy. He is our head of research here in the division, and a particular interest of his is around research integrity and how we can use that to reduce our research waste. Now, I think we all like to think that we have integrity in how we go about doing our research, but I think Karinchi provides a really interesting kind of series of points and evidence around how we can do this better and how we can improve our own practice and become better researchers, which I think would be a really positive thing for all of us to take away from today. There was intended to be a bit of an interactive element to this talk, but since last minute it switched to a recording, you're going to have to put up with seeing me again at the end of it. But for those of you who uh, take our shared module, you're used to myself and Crunchy being a bit of a double act anyway, so that's probably fine. Uh, I'll go ahead and play this now for you. Research integrity and research waste. I am Professor Kurinchi Gurusamy, Professor of Evidence-Based Medicine and Surgery and the Head of Research at our division. Today, I am going to introduce you to research integrity and research waste. I will also explain the close relationship between research integrity and avoiding research waste. I also want to get your views on research integrity and decreasing research waste in our division. What is research integrity? The core elements of research integrity are honesty, rigor, transparency and open communication, care and respect, and accountability. It should be noted that all the elements are important. Even if one aspect is missing, then the research integrity may be compromised. Further details of each element are described next. Honesty in the research integrity context refers to honesty in reporting the research objectives, research methods, collection of data, acknowledging other researchers' work, valid interpretations, and making appropriate conclusions. Being honest may not get you a lot of friends, but it will always get you the right ones. Rigor in the research integrity context refers to appropriate methods, adhering to an agreed protocol in interpretation and conclusions, and communicating the results. Transparency and open communication in the context of research integrity refers to declaring potential competing interests, reporting of research data collection methods, reporting of analysis and interpretation of data, making research findings widely available, including negative results, and presenting the work to other researchers and to the public. Care and respect in the context of research integrity refers to care and respect for research participants or subjects, including humans and animals, users and beneficiary of research, environment, and integrity of the research record. Accountability in the context of research integrity refers to collective responsibility of funders, employers, and researchers to create a research environment in which individuals and organizations are empowered and enabled to own the research process 
and ensure that individuals and organizations are held to account when behavior falls short. Spin is the intentional or non-intentional misrepresentation of study findings. There are various severities of spin. Among these, conclusion containing recommendations for clinical practice not supported by the findings is the most severe form of spin. A search of PubMed indicates that spin is rampant in biomedical literature reporting. In the next section, I am going to cover what is research waste and how is it related to research integrity. Research waste is research that's not helpful to patients and clinicians. An estimated 85% of research is research waste. There are various reasons for research waste. As you can see from the slide, only the first item is not integrated into research integrity. The only element of avoiding research waste not covered by research integrity is choosing research questions of importance to patients and clinicians. This is covered in the next few slides. Some basic principles. The research topic should be important to stakeholders, i.e. patients, clinicians, and healthcare funders, be an unmet need, be valuable, i.e. add value to existing knowledge, and feasible with the available resources. Some ways of identifying topics that are important to stakeholders are listed in this slide. While the last four items are self-explanatory, the first two are demonstrated in the video available at the link shown in this slide. This is a 10 minute demonstration on how to identify research topics that are important to stakeholders. An algorithm to decide whether there is an unmet need is shown in this slide. This is self-explanatory. Some aspects to consider when you assess the value of research are shown in this slide. Meaningless research should be avoided. An example includes looking at trivial outcomes on the basis that they are reported for systematic review or they are easy to measure for primary research or using a short follow-up period that is meaningless. For example, comparing the beneficial cardioprotective effect of aspirin after one month or measuring the cosmosis of the incision at 24 hours. Another example includes poor methodological quality based on the feasibility of completing the project. This might take the form of searching only English articles from Medline, performing a retrospective study when the research recommendations are for a randomized controlled trial, or choosing a preclinical model based on convenience and not on translation of results to humans. The major resources that you should consider for performing a research project are listed in this slide. One aspect of resource that you should consider includes knowledge and skills. You should consider whether you have the knowledge and skills to complete the project. For example, before conducting a systematic review, you need to have skills to perform one. If you are planning to perform a complex systematic review, do you have the expertise to perform one? 
another resource that you should consider is funding for example do you have sufficient funding to obtain the materials needed another resource that you should consider is time how much time are you able to commit to perform the research this sh should include the time for ethical approval the time for recruitment and follow up if you are planning primary research an algorithm to decide whether there is an unmet need is shown in this slide this slide is self explanatory there is a myth about preclinical research and research waste i have heard people telling me that they perform preclinical research and therefore their research will not be important to clinicians and patients this is wrong an example of preclinical research that is not research waste is shown in this slide you need to make sure that preclinical research informs clinical application and evaluation next i am going to show you the research integrity training framework at ucl this slide shows the framework for training researchers in research integrity this framework is currently under development at ucl surge 0002 introduces you to research methods and skills while not directly related to research integrity or decreasing research waste the researcher development framework develops different aspects of a researcher so that they can perform high quality research the researcher development framework is available at vite ukri and other major uk government funders use this framework as proof of researcher development while assessing fellowship applications doctoral skills development program at ucl is organized along the major domains of the researcher development framework please provide your views on research integrity and research waste by clicking on this link this survey is anonymous these answers will be used for discussion in the teaching committee a list of resources that i have used for developing this presentation is shown on this slide there are other resources that i have used which i have provided as links directly in the slides just going to wait on the live stream. <laughs> yeah, we're good. Okay, thank you so much to Professor Gurusami for um, sharing that with us. Obviously, it's a really important topic. And as the professor alluded to, we do actually have a survey that we would like you to complete. It's not something we want you to go away and do later. We'd actually like it, you to do it right now. So whether you're in the hall or watching on YouTube, I'd be grateful if you could follow this QR code and answer it. It's very short, just a few questions. The idea is that after having just seen this talk and kind of been introduced to some of the training available and some of the kind of ideas around research integrity that we're having within the division, we want to kind of get your raw reaction while it's nice and new and fresh. So um, if you could please go ahead and do that, I can see that most of you are, which is brilliant. And then we'll, we'll, we will reward you with your 10 minute break. Um, while you're doing that as well, just to state, obviously there were a lot of links in those slides. We do have the slides and we can share them. So please do let us know if you want any of those links.
So a nice quick survey, and I can see that everyone in the room seems to be done. If you're still going, please do finish it up. We really appreciate you sharing your comments with us. And as Professor Grusami said, we will be discussing those comments anonymously in an upcoming teaching committee, so it will help us to inform how we move forward in the division. So thank you very much uh, for doing that. And with that, another 10-minute break. Please stretch your legs and ask some questions of our fantastic presenters who really shared some really interesting, varied research today. So I'm sure they'd be love, love to chat to all of you about it.
Excuse me, everyone. I'm going to interrupt your small talks and question time. Thank you. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Katharina. Thank you for still being with us. Um, I'm happy to be here today with you and chair the last session of the day. Um, we will have a lot of talks from our wonderful postgraduate research students. And do we have Andre in the room? Ah, lovely. Do you want to come up and start, please? Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, being here and uh, listening to these wonderful um, presentations so far. Um, I am Andre, a first year PhD student, uh, part of the MRC funded doctoral training program, which uh, has an unusual structure, uh, which basically means that I can do um, three rotation pro uh, projects in my first year in three different uh, labs uh, and then decide what lab I want to continue my PhD in for the rest of the three years. Uh, and so far this year, in my first two um, rotations, uh, I had the chance to be supervised by Dr. Susan Heavey uh, in the Center for 3D Models uh, of Health and Disease, and by Dr. Pilara Sado in uh, the Royal Free Campus. Um, so, just to give you a background of myself, uh, I am originally from the beautiful country of Romania, um, and uh, during my uh, high school, um, I, my stream was mainly focused on uh, maths and computer sciences, but I still had um, a lot of time to focus on biology and natural sciences, which were uh, the actual subjects that I was always interested in. Um, so about five years ago, I moved to London to pursue uh, my uh, undergrad and postgrad at Imperial. So basically, uh, spying on the competition for four years uh, and focusing, you know, we love collaborations, um, and focusing on uh, cancer biology and immunology projects. So just an intersection between them. And uh, finally had the chance to graduate after two long years uh, uh, last month. Um, and so I just started my PhD back in October um, and had my uh, first two rotations so far. Um, and basically, uh, since it's a very um, interesting structure, uh, I would won't be focusing on the rotation projects themselves, but on the PhD program overall. Um, and the idea is that my overarching theme for, for the uh, PhD program is experimental and translational medicine. Uh, it used to be called personalized medicine when I started, uh, but all of these three terms are uh, key terms that hopefully will be defining my, my PhD journey. Um, so today I wanted to talk about the increasing interest and importance of um, developing and characterizing uh, models of cancers in a 3D setting uh, that can better mimic the actual architecture and uh, complex biology of the tumor um, compared to the usual 2D cultures that uh, you uh, usually have in the lab. Uh, so these models can vary from very simple models such as steroids, which are basically just um, clusters of cells, cancer cells usually uh, in our cases, um, attached to each other. Um, and they can also be very, very complex. So making use of different uh, types of cells that normally interact with the cancer cells, um, such as immune cells, um, as well as complicated scaffolds, uh, extracellular matrices, uh, microfluidic systems, and the list can go on and on, honestly. Um, and since these can be um, developed using patient-derived uh, cells, they can be used for personalized medicine approaches, such as screening the, um, the efficacy of drugs um, and for a certain cancer in a certain patient and inform basically the clinical uh, decision and therapeutic strategies. Um, the idea is that there still needs to be um, a balance between all of these uh, components and not overcomplicate the model, as well as carefully think about the type of research questions that you want to address using these models. So just to give an example of what I've been doing in my, so far in my rotations, um, even if pretty basic, you have uh, the 
uh, forming of spheroids that can result in that nutrient and oxygen um, uh, gradient that you want to see and that it's common for uh, many um, solid tumors. Uh, but there are also many ways in which you can assess the development of uh, spheroids, as you can see here, as well as the viability of, um, of uh, the different types of cells, and also delve deeper into the uh, molecular characterization of the interactions between different uh, cell types. So um, before that, you need to obviously optimize your model, uh, and um, this is, uh, just shows you here um, what I have been optimizing so far, um, which is a combination of bile duct cancer cells and patient-derived stromal cells, which are involved in liver injury. Um, and as you can see here, over time, uh, the, green, uh, the green cells are the cancer cells and the red ones are the uh, stromal cells, um, called solid cells. Um, and uh, you can um, analyze them over time, and obviously our, uh, the group I was doing this work in focuses on optimizing different types of combinations with immune cells and also uh, trying to validate uh, the possibility of um, using this for um, discovering new biomarkers um, and uh, studying metastasis. So even if it's in early stages, I'm really intrigued about what we can do with these types of models, uh, how to overcome certain limitations, and uh, finally have everything that we've, we've worked uh, on translated into clinic. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andre. That was a wonderful start to our session. I see you've already come up. <laughs> Uh, hello everyone, my name is Xin Kai Zhou and I am a first year PhD student of Professor Hu Bing and Ray. Uh, about three years ago I had an internship in an optical communication company and uh, last year I got my master degree from University of Glasgow. Uh, about my project, my project is about FNIRS, which is about using near infrared light to monitor some part of our body, mostly on breast or brain. The hemoglobin in blood have two kinds of effects on injected light absorption and diffusion, which we can be translated to uh, in signal as intensity changes and phase shifting. So by monitoring the intensity and the phase difference between detectors and reference signals, uh, we can manage to measure the changes in two kinds of hemoglobins. And we know that uh, um, the changes in the concentration level of hemoglobin is closely related to brain activity. Uh, so we can see that FNIRS can be seen as an alternative way to F um, fMRI because obviously both technology can monitor the brain activity in different manner. Um, Although the FNIRS have some limitation compared to the fMRI, it has some, one big advantage is that FNIRS device has potential to be made wearable. So you can keep monitoring the brain activity even when the subject is in motion rather than lying in a big machine for nearly 20 minutes to get a result. Uh, and now we already have some commercial available um, FNIRS device, and uh, they can be categorized into uh, so-called uh, continuous wave device, and they only measure the intensity changes. And uh, what my project about is we will further monitor the changes in the phase difference and uh, so-called frequency domain device. And uh, we suppose that kind of device will provide uh, the result with higher precision. Uh, about my method, uh, in the overall system design, choosing a proper phase difference measurement component is critical. Um, and we already know that some other teams have already tried to use FPGA to measure the phase difference. And um, that kind of method has already been widely utilized in many communication systems. And uh, what they do is they basically run an algorithm inside FPGA, then calculate out the phase information. Um, but for my project, however, I will try to replace the FPGA with phase detector uh, because I think using FPGA only for uh, 
calculating the phase difference is a kind of performance waste. Uh, but FPGA can still be used in FNIR's device, and uh, our next speaker, Yunyi, will tell you how to do that. Um, so I think using phase detector in FNIR's device can significantly lower down the cost and reduce the power consumption. And the most importantly is that we can further minimize the size of each FNIR's module. So I think by that way, we can be closer to a practical, fully wearable, frequency domain FNIR's device. So that's all of my presentation. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Jin Kei. That was wonderful. You need, are you, are you ready? Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Yun Yi Zhao, and I'm a first year PhD student in the Division of Surgery and Cancer. And my supervisor is Dr. Hu Bing, Professor Ri, and Dr. Shu Fan. So, I was born in China, and I have been in UK, been in UK for about five years, and I fin finalized my graduate stage in the University of Liverpool studying for the computer science and the electronic engineering. And finalized my uh, master's degree in the Imperial College, London, and studying for the medical robotics and interventional science. Um, uh, oh, yeah, uh, and I have uh, some projects in the Harmony Center, uh, which is more system state. So, and during my leisure time, I like to watch tennis games and uh, some esports programs. So here is the tennis game in the Wimbledon and the Shanghai Pro, Pro League esports games and the 2019 uh, esports games held in the Berlin. And, do, and so after work, I sometimes with, uh, we're hiking with my friends and maybe eat some barbecues. <laughs> and I'm also a standalone gamer. And if you someone might know what is this me. <laughs> so this is uh, my most favorite uh, games uh, recently, the uh, Elder Rings. <laughs> yeah. So let's move to my project. So the aim for my project is to develop an embedded hardware system to achieve they use the reconfigurable hardware, which is FPGA, and to achieve the real-time localized FNIR signal processing, and alongside with the uh, signal reconstructions or other image, image processing techniques. And <laughs> the deep neural networks will be used to do the, to, to do the reconstructions and some state-of-art um, State of our algorithm will be used to, to it will be implemented on the FPGA chip. So a FPGA is the field programmable gate array, and a FPGA, FPGA is a hardware circuit which the user can program uh, the, the, their desired algorithm through hardware design languages such as VHDL or Verilog. And as you can see here. The FPGA chip is very, very small, especially compared to the original GPUs or CPUs. Uh, but it has a, a relative the same power, parallel computing power on some, uh, during some circum circumstances. Um, <clears throat> the, tra the traditional PCs and workstations works very good, but their, their large, uh, large size and the high power consumption makes it impossible to use on the wearable devices. <coughs> so as, um, and here, uh, here, is, uh, here is my method. So firstly, I will use the lab available uh, devices to collect the raw FNIRS data. Uh, <coughs> uh, then after I got the signals, I will do the signal preprocessing through MATLAB and filtering and remove the motion artifacts, as you may know. Uh, after that, I will prepare the training data set 
uh, still on MATLAB or Python, some, some language, any language is uh, just a tool. And to, to do the uh, network training, then I can train the neural network with the workstations. Um, and it may take some time, but uh, after I got the optimize the neural network, I can then try to perform it on uh, uh, the original IPJ boards. And the most challenging part, it should be, uh, it, 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 because it is the cooperation between my hardware and software. Because my hardware, I will perform my hard, uh, implement my, hard, uh, my software first. So my uh, hardware FPGA may not have the efficient computing power to perform the neural network I designed before. However, with the help of neural network pruning, uh, I'll, I can reduce the total computing power of my neural network and achieve the relatively same performance. <clears throat> With those techniques, I can, I, I believe I can, I, I finalize this whole system with a very reasonable speed and uh, processing uh, results. And that's my introduction of my PhD project. Thank you everyone for listening. And hopefully I can learn and cooperate with your genius guys in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That sounds like a fascinating topic. Um, Anuja, unfortunately, is unwell today. If you're watching from home, we're wishing you a speedy recovery. So I'll just rudely skip to the next person. So Adriana Monica Radu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Adriana and I'm a first year PhD student. My supervisor are Dr. Gavin Gell, who is in the audience with us, and Dr. Julian Jones from Imperial College London. Um, I'm a part of a cohort from the Center for Doctoral Training in the Advanced Characterization of Materials. So I'm a student both at UCL uh, and the Imperial College London. So someone mentioned before that Imperial College London is our uh, competition. Actually, I made them my partners. Um, who am I outside the lab? I tried that a nice way to answer this question, so I think the best way to describe me is that I'm a travel passionate and a hopeless romantic. Um, I love to explore and discover new places, and uh, also, in case you're wondering, the love story behind the pictures is as beautiful as they are, and it's been going on for more than 10 years. <laughs> now, let's move on to my background. Uh, I've studied chemical engineering in Romania, and no, it wasn't all about chemical plants. I studied biomaterials as well, and uh, at that point I realized that if I want to make a true impact in the regenerative medicine field, I need to learn more about cell biology and cell material interactions, so that's why I obtained an MSc uh, degree in nanotechnology and regenerative medicine from um, UCL. What does the future hold for me? I'm not sure, maybe a career in academia or research, but also at the same time, my goal is to be an entrepreneur, so I dream that someday I'll start uh, a UCL uh, B spin out. Now, let's move on to my project. Uh, at this point, it is crucial to mention that uh, for maintaining healthy bones and for achieving a healthy repair process, we need to have a normal bone, uh, bone remodeling. This can only be achieved by maintaining a balance in the bone resorbed by osteoclasts and the bone formed by the osteoblast. Unfortunately, the story changes in diabetic patients. They have an impaired bone remodeling process that is due to a hostile environment created by high glucose concentrations. They determine uh, increased amounts of uh, free radicals, such as react reactive oxygen species, that further disrupt many processes and pathways that are important in bone remodeling. Uh, and most importantly, they inhibit bone cells formation and function that leads to uh, ultimately to a poor bone quality for the diabetic patients. 
And why is this important? It is important in the context that half a billion people worldwide have diabetes. And also, they have an increased risk of fracture with impaired healing and an extended recovery time. Uh, this leads to complication occurrence, so they are in a lot of pain when they have a fracture and they, are, they have a poor quality of life. Uh, this leads us to my aim, uh, which is to investigate ions as potential regulators of bone cells' function for disease bone remodeling materials. Uh, one example of such materials is uh, cobalt releasing bioactive glasses. Now, how am I planning to do this? I will use uh, primary bone cells as well as cancer-derived uh, bone cells in healthy and diabetic models. The diabetic models are high glucose uh, uh, concentrations. I'll do my experiments both in 2D and in 3D in vitro models, and I will uh, apply a multidisciplinary characterization approach in which I will use advanced characterization methods to look uh, at uh, the structure and the composition of laboratory bone grown and at the substrate used for uh, osteoclast resorption. For example, I will use Raman spectroscopy to look at the biochemical composition of the laboratory grown bone and compare it to that of uh, um, natural bone. Finally, I will end my talk with some preliminary promising results. In here, I obtained osteoclasts from a selected raw to 6, 4.7 uh, population of macrophages, and uh, which were differentiated in a very low concentration of Rankel. Um, in figure B, uh, we can notice that cobalt at 12.5 and 25 micromolar was able to upregulate the TAF5B, the osteoclast-specific uh, enzyme activity inhibited by hyperglycemia to levels uh, present in the low glucose control. So this gives us hope that uh, cobalt uh, can be a promising uh, uh, ion for uh, upregulating bone uh, uh, regeneration in diabetic patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adriana. That was wonderful. Do we have Tan Zhu in the room? No? Okay. <laughs> Bo? Yes. Hi. Lovely. <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Prem Kamun Chepanikun, or you can call me Bo. I'm a PhD student under the supervision of Dr. Kate Wickett, Dr. Susan Heavey, and Professor Rifat Hamudi. So a little bit about me, uh, I was born in the south of Thailand, and my nickname is Bo. It's actually come from Bo Thai, which is a bit weird, but it's actually the same meaning and the same word in Thai. Uh, I did my BSc in physics at Imperial College, and I continued to do my master's degree in medical physics at UCL and start doing my PhD in medical physics right after. And for the plan, um, I plan to be a lecturer and researcher after I finish my PhD, and maybe we'll be a baker as well. Uh, so yeah, why not do everything that we want to do? Um, outside my study, I love playing badminton and also tennis. I like drawing as well, and these little cartoons that I show on the slides is actually something that I draw. And I also like K-pop music, and my favorite band is Astro. So yeah, move on to my research. So uh, I'm focusing on the mechanisms of nanoparticle enhanced radiotherapy. So as you may know that there are so many people that uh, suffer from cancer. And in fact, we can expect that there will be one in two UK people that will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their lifetime. And by 2040, uh, there will be about 27.5 million new cases of cancer uh, around the world each year. So yeah, because of this number, we really need to find a more effective way to treat cancer so that we can save more uh, people, uh, more lives. And one of the methods is using nanoparticles in combination with radiation. Um, it has been proved that it's very useful and effective, but the thing is we don't really know what's actually going on inside. We don't really know like why nanoparticle, especially in combination, worked. And uh, how does it change our gene expression inside the cells? And also, like, 
they don't really, uh, there are limited number of study actually like to understand what pathways or what um, mechanisms that involve in, in this type of therapy. So that is something that I want to focus on and, and it's a question that I uh, want to find an answer. By understanding um, the mechanism and the pathway of nanoparticle enhanced radiotherapy, we can actually improve the treatment outcome by improving the nanoparticles, which also not just the radiation therapy, we can be used in uh, other type of cancer treatment. And yeah, so for the method, um, we plan to use in vitro 3D models and lots of people have, to, have been talking about spheroid. We are using spheroid as well, but we use glioblastoma cell, which is the brain cancer. Um, after we form the model, we plan to incubate them in the gadolinium-based nanoparticles. And the reason that we cho choose gadolinium is because gadolinium has the paramagnetic magnetic uh, property and also it has the high atomic number so it can give the benefit in terms of increase the contrast of the MR imaging and also uh, increase the effective of the radiation which will be very good use when we use the MR Linux which is like MRI in combination with radiation. So yeah, back to my project. I incubate them in the gadolinium based nanoparticle solution I irradiate them with the X-ray radiation, and then to track the treatment response of the tumor, we plan to use uh, bright field images and also fluorescent images. And in terms of gene expression study, lots of people have been mentioning spatial transcriptomics, and this is quite like hot topic, which I agree. Uh, we will use the same method, spatial transcriptomics. And the benefit is because, uh, as uh, some people have been mentioning before, that um, with spatial transcriptomic, we get the gene expression data within the region of interest. And uh, as I think Andrea has been mentioning that the spheroid, we have like different zonation. So spatial transcriptomic will give us a benefit as well that we can pick the region of interest in different zonation inside the spheroid. And then we will see the gene expression that change depending on the zonation, which will give us like more uh, detail in depth. And from that gene expression data, we plan to analyze them using gene set enrichment analysis, and then we can get uh, the pathway and mechanism that involve in nanoparticle enhanced radiotherapy, and which hopefully will like give us some interesting result. But unfortunately, I don't have the result yet. But please do follow me on the social media, so you will be the first one to know when I discover something. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. We had to skip you, but you can come now, Tan. Okay, Tan made a surprise appearance. The floor so is yours. Sorry, everyone. Um, I had an emergency thing, so I had to come late. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so my name is Tan, and same as Bill, my supervisors are Dr. Dr. Kate Ricketts and Dr. Susan Heavey. Um, I'm a final year PhD. <clears throat> and a little bit about me, I have three dogs, the left three, I have a cat, his name is Noki, um, he climbs trees and he catch mice. I graduated from Lanzhou University in China, I did a degree in physics for my undergrad and my master's degree was at UCL, it was medical physics, no sorry, yeah medical physics and then for my PhD I made a transition into more biology based stuff. And um, about my research, I think it'll be a bit easier if we start on this slide. <clears throat> So um, this is actually the first part of my entire PhD. And the second part is actually what Bo just talked about. We're moving in more in depth on our biology model. But this was where I started. So our idea was to treat glioblastoma, glioblastoma tumors. And as a lot of you know, it's a rather nasty tumor because, um, well, regardless of the survival rate, just when you read the papers, you can see when people treat cell lines, they have to use three-fold, even four-fold higher than the radiation dose they use on other cell lines, other cancer cell lines. So this is a very nasty tumor. And the idea was to combine some very novel and new techniques in radiotherapy to see if we can target this tumor more and get some results. Um, and the two methods that I used, one was the nanoparticle that Bo just mentioned, the other in the early stages of my PhD, I tried carbon iron, 
And um, as some of you know, carbon iron is just much heavier than the, X, the photon beam that we use in clinical situations. Um, and because of its, how heavy it is, um, it, inter it interacts with the tissue differently. So it will hold on to a lot of its energy until it slows down to a certain speed, and then it releases its energy, creating something called a BRAC peak in its dose um, release. You can see in the top left corner, yeah, top left corner, uh, a carbon iron beam. And if you can overlap that BRAC peak that I just talked about onto the tumor of a human, you can therefore localize the dose into the tumor and spare the healthy tissue before and after and around the tumor, localizing the dose. And combining that with nanoparticle, which I'm not sure if Bill mentioned, uh, is when a radiation beam hits a high atomic number nanoparticle, it releases a string of secondary electrons and reactive oxygen species that therefore go on and damage the tumor cells even more. So then again, it is again localizing the dose into the tumor and sparing the healthy tissue. So I was just trying to try each of these methods and also combine them and also do a lot of experiments on the clinical, the more widely used clinical radiation, which is just photon irradiation, and compare the results. And the biology model that I've been using are 2D and 3D glioblastoma cells, U87 cell lines, um, nowadays focused more on 3D. Um, and some of the results, as you can see on the right here, so, um, the left three graphs going from top to down are carbon iron irradiation from zero gray dose, three gray dose, and the bottom one is five gray dose. And the three figures on the right are x-ray doses from zero gray control to 12 gray x-ray to 16 gray x-ray. So comparing them side to side is that um, is based on basically carbon iron is about threefold stronger than x-ray, so the biological impact should be relatively the same comparing the figures left and right. And what you can see here is, obviously with zero gray, there's no impact, your sphere just grows. With slightly higher dose, three gray carbon iron, 12 gray x-ray, um, you can inhibit the growth a little bit, but also um, in the x-ray, you start to see the difference, the enhancement of the nanoparticle. So the red line here with the nanoparticle is now significantly lower or smaller in size than the one of the non-nano. And the difference between the nano and non-nano just appears very greatly in the highest doses in both X-ray and carbon iron, uh, as you can see in the bottom two graphs. And another thing is um, the dose cutoff uh, that shows the enhancement of nanoparticle also is the dose cut cutoff where there is a treatment success. So the top four graphs, the spheroid just keeps growing. Um, only when you reach the one dose point, you can get a treatment success as in your sphere starts to shrink. So nowadays our study is to try to pinpoint where that dose point is, try to study why it responds this way and what happens in the bio biology model. And going back to the previous slide, um, basically our research question is how radiation responds, uh, how U87 spheres respond to radiation differently. Um, the big picture, novel treatment method for glioblastoma, i.e. carbon iron, nanoparticle combined. And my contribution is combining them and doing experiments and the impact hopefully will be to help us predict treatment outcome of glioblastoma. Thank you. Thank you, Tan. I believe we are on to one of our last presenters for the day. Bit, the floor is yours when you're ready. Hi. So my name is Vit. I'm a first year PhD student who started uh, around about September, autumn last year. Uh, my supervisor is Dr. Susan Heavey, and I'm, my PhD is basically centered in the 3D modeling uh, center for health and disease, and it's all about 3D models of cancer. So um, just a quick whistle-top tour of my CV. After graduating from Sheffield Allen University uh, with a BSc in biomedical science, I moved on to a, a charity called Anthony Nolan, where I worked as a research assistant in transplant research, specifically in the use of stem cell transplant 
in uh, blood cancer patients. So a lot of gene sequencing results, um, a lot of stem cell biology, uh, basically to try and regenerate the bone marrow. Um, after that, it was to a company called Mina Therapeutics, where we were developing RNA-based oligonucleotide drugs, um, which this was a time when gene therapy in cancer treatments was an emerging, um, a, a quite a big thing, um, especially with the use of oligonucleotide drugs to upregulate tumor suppressor genes to halt cancer progression. Uh, and going into the future, after this PhD, um, there's a pattern of medical treatments, and this is something I want to continue in the drug development industry. So, my project, what is it? Well, over the past 10 years or so, 3D models in cancer research have become quite a big thing, garnering interest as a stepping stone alternative to a live system like a mouse model or a patient in a clinical trial. Um, with live animals, you'd have the ethical approvals associated with it, but with a 3D model, you've got a nice in vitro system where you can test out your research questions to see if they're worth pursuing before you start the rigorous process of either developing a mouse model or recruiting patients for your clinical trial. However, more recently, 3D models in cancer research have also started using cells and tissue from the patients themselves. So you have a preserved system within a 3D model where you can match tumor architecture back to the patient on a personalized uh, basis. And this, kind of, this can be invaluable, especially to the drug development industry, where at the moment there's a huge regulatory emphasis on mouse models. However, this is one of the reasons attributed to the poor clinical translation of cancer development drugs. About 60% of failures, and a significant portion of this is attributed to the use of mouse models where you've got poor homology in terms of genetics between a mouse and a patient, and even the obvious differences such as the physical size. A mouse is so much smaller than a human patient, so you're gonna have different pharmacokinetics and different pharmacodynamics of drugs, which is where my project and the projects of everyone else in this field kind of, kind of comes in, where you can take, resect a tumor tissue, in this case, a prostate tumor tissue, culture it for a couple of days in a range of models, going from spheroid models, uh, microfluidics, more complex models such as bioprinting, and for a few days, you've got a chunk of tissue that you can grow up in a way where the architecture, all the signaling pathways can be mapped back to whatever patient you're treating. You can test whatever drug you're interested in and the results can be tracked back to your patient on a personalized basis. So this is kind of the background. So what have I done so far? Well, at the moment we're working on a, a big spatial transcriptomics project where we have prostate tumor tissue um, as part of a biobank which has previously been cultured in one of the simplest models at the moment, which is a gelatin sponge culture, which is just a chunk of prostate tissue um, on a sponge scaffold bathed in media so that the tumor tissue can be viable for a few days before you do whatever analysis you want to do on it. This tissue is then processed into uh, microscopic slides, and then we do something called segmented um, gene sequencing. Uh, with a company called Nanostring. Um, so people have already talked about spatial transcriptomics, but I just want to emphasize the segmentation process. We segmented the tumor tissue with two regions of tumor called tumor stroma and tumor epithelium. Um, I just wanted to bring this up because in cancer research, there is a huge amount of emphasis on developing drugs targeting regions of the epithelium, such as immune compartments, which is rightly so. They're a huge part of cancer biology. But tumor-associated stroma is currently an underdeveloped and under-researched part of cancer development. And more and more research is coming out that shows the importance of stroma. For example, studies indicate the presence of cancer-associated fibroblasts, a cell type that's prevalently known in stroma, has been seen in cases where patients have undergone recurrence of um, tumors. So that, I mean, that kind of acts as a biomarker to kind of halt the progress of cancer and find different ways of um, developing treatments. Um, that's kind of the uh, razzmatazz of our gene sequencing experiment at the moment. We don't have 
It's still undergoing analysis at the moment, but um, uh, we'll, see what, we'll see what the results bring out. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you as well. Um, I believe it's time to hand over to Susan so we can all have our Eurovision moment and vote, right? The stage is yours. Thank you, Katarina, and thanks to everyone again in that session. Let's do one more round of applause for all our postgraduate research presenters. <laughs> it is a Eurovision moment. I'm afraid I'm not going to have phone calls to different countries, but the best we can do is a Slido poll. These are your codes for all of you in the hall and anyone watching on YouTube to vote for the best presentation and the most entertaining presentation, so two different Slido polls. I'm going to leave this up for a minute or two so you can catch it on your phones. Um, I'm going to reactivate them right now. I did just test them, and within a couple of minutes, we got a flood of votes in both categories, all for the same person. <laughs> so um, you know who you are, maybe, maybe you don't, maybe you've just got a lot of fans on YouTube. But uh, I've reset it now, and I'd ask you all on the honor system to vote responsibly for who you thought was the best presentation and the most entertaining presentation. Okay, those are both reactivated now. I'll just give one more minute for you guys to copy that code. And then if you're still mulling over your decision, I'll give you another 15 minutes during the first half of this next keynote to uh, finalize your votes in those systems. If you've managed to lose the code as well, it's also in the YouTube description. Um, so you can get it from the, the description box on the YouTube live stream on the main ECL channel. We all got the codes? Think so? Yeah. Okay, our next keynote presentation is another very exciting one. Again, unfortunately not in person. Um, Dr. Farley is unfortunately stuck out of the country at the moment. However, he has recorded a really, really interesting talk for us on sustainability. We're really lucky to have him here as he actually leads on sustainability, not just within our division, but outside of our division for all of UCL, as well as in King's. So we're getting a kind of whole London perspective here on how we can make our research more sustainable. It's a really, really important topic. And I think a great way to end the day because it's something we can definitely all learn from and we can all implement into our research. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Martin Farley, and uh, apologies I can't be with you today in person, um, but I hope you enjoyed this recording. I've given a try for this um, floating head uh, feature that Zoom has so that you can see both the slides and, and my face at the same time. I hope it's not too off-putting. But um, um, so um, I work at uh, UCL and King's College, so some of the references are going to come from both. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about the sustainability of science. Now, to set the scene, um, why are we talking about sustainability in science? Well, um, you know, when we look at science as a whole, and we, you know, science, we have the largest workforce that we've ever had. So um, we have more people working in the sciences than ever before. Um, we obviously have plenty left to research, and we're in the midst of an extremely competitive funding environment. So there's more money going into science, but at the same time, it's, um, at, an, it's at its most competitive level to actually access those financial funds. Um, now, we're also in the midst of a climate crisis, and I think it's important to remember that it's going to affect every facet of society, and science is no different. Um, and also, we also have concerns over our methods. Now, you might have heard of something called the crisis of reproducibility. This is around um, the issues of um, you know, ensuring that as much of our science is as reproducible as possible. And I would argue um, that um, you know, reproducibility and research integrity are sustainability issues. Um, and um, this is some, uh, a survey out of nature, uh, you know, essentially showing that people agree that there was a reproducibility crisis. Um, but I think the point that I wanted to make is, is more here is that um, there's this duality between sustainability and reproducibility. One is in the mechanism of improvement, and that would be through good lab practice. So both sustainability and reproducibility can be um, at least 
largely or partially addressed through good lab practices. And then through outcome, you know, this other duality. So, um, you know, if you were to improve um, our, our, the sustainability or reproducibility in, in both those senses, you're using your resources better. So there's this common ground between the two topics that I think is, is quite interesting. And um, I wrote a blog on it a few years ago, um, uh, but we'll connect this with Leaf in a, in a little bit. So um, this is a long-winded way of trying to say is that when we take a step back and look at science, you know, we have the largest workforce we've ever had. We have plenty left to research. We're in the midst of a climate crisis. We have concerns of our methods. Um, and we have, um, and it's a very competitive funding environment. Um, you also take a step back and you realize that, you know, the UK wants to massively increase its investment in the sciences in the next couple of years um, as a percentage of its GDP. Um, but it also wants to reach its net zero goals. Uh, you know, with how resource intensive science is, you know, something's got to give. And um, we, we need to look at how we conduct our science long term. Science needs to integrate environmental sustainability. Now, um, I'm going to whip through these kind of quickly, but um, I wanted to give you uh, a few, um, well, I'll put my head down there, um, uh, a few um, uh, quiz questions. So um, lab plastics were estimated to contribute what percentage towards uh, to the total global plastic waste in 2014? I'll admit we need more research in this area, and I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, but the answer was um, C, 1.8%. Um, a new ultra low temperature freezer will consume as much energy in a year as, um, and keep in mind both Kings and UCL have at least 500 of these. Um, and the answer is household. Um, each freezer will consume as much energy as a household. I call them ultra low temperature freezers, but um, that's because they don't need to be at minus 80, but you might call them also minus 80s. And that doesn't take into account also the energy that goes into cool the, the freezer rooms on a hot day. Um, which piece of standard lab equipment that I've listed in front of you consumes the most energy? Um, the answer is A, it's fume cupboards, and they use around two to three houses worth of energy per unit. Um, yeah, uh, in some, some buildings, they can be extremely inefficient, uh, and some buildings, they can be more efficient. If you just close the sash, that's the best thing you can do to get it more down to, to two houses worth. Um, Researchers accounted for what percentage of the world population in 2013? Now, I wanted to share this because we don't actually know the full carbon emissions of science. Um, but we do know that it's just under 2% of the world's GDP financially, and it's an extremely resource intensive um, uh, area. And um, the answer here is B, it's 0.1%. Um, and I think the point is that 0.1% is affecting 2% of an extremely resource intensive area. So you, it's a very high impact area. The point is, is that environmentally, I'm sure it's going to be comparable to around 2%, but we don't have the data yet. Um, between 2007 and 13, the world economy grew by 20.1%. How fast did gross expenditure on research and development grow by? This is one that um, people often get wrong, um, but uh, well, the wrong is uh, no wrong answers in this quiz. Um, but um, the answer is D. Um, so it outpaced the rate of growth by, of the global economy by 50%, um, which is pretty impressive. You know, it's it's a very high growth area. Um, this is something uh, uh, another um, stat which. Um, uh, complements the previous one. So how much does science grow by every year? And this is, they admittedly were looking at um, publication rates and citation rates. Um, and if you're an extremely astute mathematician, then you can say, uh, you know, if it grows by that percentage, what is the doubling time of all of scientific output? Which is crazy um, to, when, when I tell you it. But um, the answer that they gave was D. So it, it grows by eight to 9%, which gave a doubling time of just nine years. So science is, is booming, um, and I'd, I'd be really curious, this was a 2014 study, but I'd be curious um, what some more research, uh, more recent statistics are in this area. Now, I don't know the answers to this question. I, I, I like um, asking it in my talks as a, as a you know, <laughs> um, you know, just to, to point out uh, that um, how resource intensive science is and do we get the most out of it? Um, what percentage of research conducted that gets, um, is, sorry, what percentage of all the research conducted gets published or is shared widely, or if you wanna say is accessible and reproducible. 
So, you know, um, how much of our science is really meeting that sort of gold standard in that um, we know it's reproducible and it's accessible by everybody? Um, I don't know the answer to this, but I can tell you what people usually tell me when I give this quiz. Um, and they usually say between 10 and 20, sometimes 30%, which is, you know, not as high as we would like. You know, a lot of science is what is dubbed negative results, and we don't share that research for the most part out. And, you know, that science still took resources to produce. Um, so I'll leave it at that, but um, uh, I'll, I'll try to tie this back to leave in it in a little bit. So science is growing. This is some more up-to-date figures, but you can see is that um, this is a percentage of investment on science uh, of, of the total GDP, and the UK is at 1.72% which is actually, it's much lower than the other research heavy countries like Germany or France um, or the US or China. And that's why the UK government wants to massively increase investment in sciences in the coming years. Now, um, on a slight, uh, slight deviation, but I think it's important to say this, is, is to always think about the directions of science and, and where they're motivated. You know, um, Most of the science we do in higher education, um, especially at UCL and King's is, is around health. Um, and the environment. And, and um, I'm sure you're all doing fantastic research, um, which is going a great way. But it's, it's worth remembering that um, a lot of research um, uh, is conducted and motivated by financial reasons as well. Um, you know, in 2019, there was 147,000 articles on AI, but just 2,500 on carbon capture. And in 2019, we knew what we needed, you know, what was more um, pressing in terms of a requirement for... for um, you know, having a, a health and, and um, a lovely environment, and, and that's carbon capture. But um, anyways, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I wanted to just um, food for thought type. Um, yes. So um, this is from, uh, uh, this, this data here is from UCL. But this is essentially showing that um, around half our energy is going towards lab spaces. So, um, you know, if we're going to talk about um, achieving net zero in terms of our carbon emissions around our energy consumption, labs are the elephant in the room. By the way, this is very comparable to any research intensive institution. King's, I think, is about the same. Um, it, it might be higher. I know Oxford is actually higher than that. So, um, you know, uh, we, we need to chat about those spaces. Now, um, I'm going to move my head a little bit. Uh, sorry about this. I'm just giving this a try. But um, sustainable labs and green labs is this big, wide topic. Um, there's plenty to do in it. And um, I see it in these, these big areas, but um, I just want to say is that, um, you know, we think that the built environment ties you in in terms of energy consumption, and it, and it kind of does sometimes. But in terms of carbon emissions, which is the bigger impact, the things you do in terms of how you use your equipment and consumables and your lab operations is the biggest impact. So, you know, energy consumption is one thing, but carbon emissions is all the stuff that you use, you buy, you consume, and that is the bigger impact long-term. And I'll, I'll show you some, some data to back that up from UCL, although I will say it's hard to estimate. Uh, and just behind my head here is, is green chemistry. Green chemistry is the topic um, where we look at um, the, the substitution replacement of harmful chemicals, either for us or the environment, with less harmful ones. Um, and it's, um, you know, we need more work in area in this area as well, but um, it, it's an exciting new area underway. Um, I'm going to focus on lab operations and equipment and consumables, but there's plenty more we could talk about in a longer talk. Now, um, I wanted to let you know that there's a lot going on around sustainable labs. Um, we're not alone. Um, you know, Green Labs Netherlands, there's a national network there, and there's a national network in Austria. There's a national, there's a European effort, I, I need to update the slide, CELS, um, which... Um, you know, ties together some of these networks. There's a podcast called The Caring Scientist. Um, there's consultancies. There's the Max Planck Sustainability Network. There's a lot more coming out in this space. There's articles. There's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's an exciting space to work in. And, um, you know, I've been lucky enough to be working in it for about 10 years now, but um, there's so much more to, to do. So um, if you're interested, come join, come join us. Um, I should say as well that we have a UK network called Lean, um, and if you're interested in joining that, um, you can check it out, lean-science.org. Um, essentially, it's a, you know, we put resources up and we meet, but it's a Google group of people that share good practice stuff around sustainable labs. Um, so um, we'd really encourage you to check it out, or just drop a line. Um, you can always email me if you have any questions um, around this area. Um, so, okay. Uh, oof. Um, 
I don't know how many more times I'll do this floating head thing. And um, so why are we talking, you know, before I was talking about carbon emissions versus energy consumption. And the reason I'm doing that is because this is the full carbon emissions of UCL. And we don't have this for, for um, a lot of institutions, um, but at UCL, we did this. And we could see that um, energy is actually a pretty small portion of our overall carbon emissions. Now, remember half of our energy consumption came from labs and about half of all of this purple slice, the purple chunk of the pie, is all this, you know, is from labs as well. And that's all the products that we buy, all the materials. And essentially what we see is that, um, you know, labs are around half our carbon emissions at UCL. So if we're going to really deal with our long-term uh, reductions, we have to be working in our labs. Um, at the same time, it's really hard to take action or even estimate this. Um, and by the way, a little bit of a, a slightly depressing fact is that when you hear about net zero targets of most institutions, they're usually just focusing on that blue um, slice of the pie. This one, we barely have a handle on. And why? Because nobody knows the true carbon emissions, the stuff you buy. Now, this is oat milk that you can buy. And, and, and you can see in tiny writing there, um, they've written um, the kilograms of CO2 per kilogram. And that's exactly the figure that we need for so much, well, for everything, if we're going to set targets. And that's in part why we don't set these wider targets of carbon emissions is because we don't actually know our full impact. You know, if you buy a can of Coke or, sorry, if you buy a, a fridge, you know how much energy it's going to consume, but you really don't have much of a clue about um, the carbon emissions it took to manufacture that. And that's what we need to change long-term to be able to address these things. Um, this is a paper that I worked on with some colleagues, or actually one colleague, um, Benoit Nicolet. And um, this is the type of, of work that I think we really need in this space. Um, and I'm biased because I, you know, I wrote this paper, but this was looking at um, the CO2 emissions. So a life cycle assessment of reusing labware versus single use. And what we were essentially showing is something that people might've inherently known, but what we were showing was that when you reuse labware, whether it's glass or plastic, you massively reduce your carbon emissions. And um, so you can see here with time, you know, the single use um, ended up having much higher um, carbon emissions than the reusable either glass or plastic. And, and interesting, we found that actually over time, your costs were either comparable or um, quite um, significantly lower um, by reusing as well. You know, consumable costs are going up. So, um, I won't go into too much depth in this, but I think this is the type of work that we need. Now, what makes it really confusing is that marketing is completely unregulated, to be frank, right, right now. You know, there's a lot of greenwashing out there. And what I have put on the screen right now is good schemes. These are schemes that um, lead to actual reuse. Star Lab, um, uh, they, the tip box recycling scheme, actually, to be honest, wasn't reuse, it was recycling. And by the way, if your tip box, I know Star Lab has discontinued these um, recycling schemes, put your tip box in the normal recycling. Same thing happens. But NEB um, will actually reuse its packaging and its um, ice packs. And these companies will reuse their solvent bottles. And those are examples of good practice. Oh, very quickly, if you're using tip boxes, reload the tip box. Most of the plastic is in the box. So, you know, you would save there. Now, I think the direction we need to go is, is more in-house products like this. This is um, a, a company called Grenova made this tip washing machine, which I think is just a lovely, fantastic idea. And they actually did a life cycle assessment of manufacturing the, the, um, the, you know, the machine versus the reuse of tip boxes. And this washes tips on site for you. And it admittedly doesn't do filter tips, but it washes tips. And that's exactly the type of product that we need. I've seen another th uh, a really interesting product that um, makes uh, cell culture media for you on site. So you don't have to have it transported in because most of it's just water anyways, you know? And um, so I think these are the type of products we need to see long-term. Now this is the opposite end of the spectrum and I won't say their company name, but this is straight up greenwashing. And um, this is a company that was trying to push single use mouse cages and markets it as more sustainable. Um, they market it as more sustainable because you use your autoclave, yes, less, but Sure, you use it less, but that means you end up with a pile of plastic on the other end. And it's just, you know, I wouldn't take umbrage with um, this if they didn't market it as more sustainable. And I, I think what I'm just trying to highlight with this is 
is how confusing it is. It's really tough to know when something is more sustainable. And by the way, I'm a resource for you. If you're ever unsure, drop me a message. Um, I'll put my email up. Uh, and if you can't find it, um, um, uh, well, yeah, you can find me if you just Google, you know, Martin Farley uh, Sustainable Labs Program, uh, UCL or Kings. Now, um, this is a company, you know, Kim Tech, they did a, a glove recycling program. And I love the idea, but again, this is, I think, on the verge of greenwashing. And the reason I say that is because they, they require you to use one type of gloves, even though they're all 100% nitrile, or they should be. Um, and, you know, they charge you for this. But I think the key point is this, is that they provide you zero evidence with what is happening with the gloves and how they're being recycled. Um, and we need to know if we're going to manage these programs that they're better than what we're doing with them, which is burning them for energy recovery, which is not ideal, but at the same time, it's better than sitting in a landfill or someplace. But we need evidence of this, you know, and if somebody's going to market something as sustainable, I think we need to push suppliers to give us the evidence so we can support these schemes better. Anyways, um, I, it's a doozy out there, you know, and, and that's why we need more research. Um, if you're interested in this space, you want to do some research, I can give you some ideas. Um, but we need more life cycle assessments. We need more studies like comparing single use to, to reusable. Um, there's so much more to be done out there. So um, if you're interested in the topic, get in touch or, um, or give it a try. Um, really motivatingly, I think, is that the Medical Research Council put out a grant to essentially facilitate this. They put out a million pounds and the grant closed in, in um, March. But um, essentially, they said, we need to study this area more. So you know, expect to see more studies in this area because, you know, we don't know how to do net zero science yet. We don't know how to do it. Um, unless, you know, unless you're just with a chalkboard, but we don't know how to do net zero science. We need to work on this more. And, um, and it's great to see the funders are supporting this. Now, um, we need more research in this space, but don't take that away. We need action now as well. If, if you've seen the IPCC report recently, you know that we don't have a lot of time. Um, we need to take action now uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, uh, and, and we know some of the things that we can do to make science immediately more environmentally sustainable. And, um, you know, you hear a lot about these net zero targets and everything. Um, and like I said, we don't know how to do net zero science, but our institutions have set net zero targets. Um, you know, um, UCL is a net zero target for 2030. Um, King's has one for 2025. Admittedly, King's will not hit that target um, at its current rate. You know, it's not being supported appropriately, I have to, you know, to be frank, but um, uh, not for lack of effort, but um, it, it's just what we, we're not on the correct path in, at King's. But UKRI is the largest funder, and they've actually set a net zero target for 2040, which is a game changer, I have to say. You know, no other large funder has set a big target like that, which is, um, it's really helped open the door for us. And I, I, I really got to commend the folks at NERC who, who did the work on that. Um, so they set the targets and now we got to figure out how to get there. And, you know, for some reason, when we wanted science to be safe, the health and safety executive didn't say, yo, go invent your own safety standards. Everybody figure it out on your own. When, when Sally Davis, um, the chief medical officer, wanted to promote gender equality, gender equality in the sciences, she didn't say, everybody go figure it out. She said, no, if you don't meet a certain level of Athena Swan, you don't get research funding. Now, for some reason with sustainability, we've completely left it up to everybody to figure it out on themselves. And I think that's got to change. You know, I think we need standards in this space, just like with health and safety and just like with gender equality. And um, and that's why we have created LEAF. Now, we've created LEAF from UCL, but it's in use in a lot of other institutions. And you know, if your lab isn't signed up, please do sign up. Um, it's a standard in sustainable lab operations. You could say it's a certification in green labs. Um, and it's got criteria in actions in all of the things that um, I haven't gotten to speak about today um, for the sake of time, but all the things you might expect. And we also were the first initiative to really tie um, research quality and integrity with sustainability. Um, so we have a few criteria in that space as well. Um, there's bronze, silver, gold criteria, um, and it's a user-led initiative. And it's got um, uh, calculators which allow you to estimate the carbon and financial impacts of the actions you take. Um, so you know, I think that's really important to be able to quantify these things because 
if we can't quantify, you know, that, that's how we know we're, we're achieving more. So um, um, I won't go through it all, but, um, you know, these are some of the targets you might be expected to, to, to do in LEAF. But I think really the best thing I can say is just sign up. I'm lowering my head a bit so you can see it. Um, but, um, you know, we're just asking you to do things that align with good lab practice. Like I said in the beginning, just like with quality research, sustainable research, we want to promote good lab practice. So um, sign up and, you know, um, you can get in touch if you have questions on how this works. Uh, and, um, and I'm here as a resource. We have um, a supporting team. And, um, and yeah, uh, you, you sign up online. And if your lab, either you join an existing lab or create a new one. Um, by the way, I didn't show the, the, another slide before, but, um, you know, LEAF saves money. It saves a lot of carbon. Um, so I think it's, it's, a, it's you know, it's a win-win. We have resources for folks um, in this space, and we just made a new one of these uh, for Kings, which is the recycling poster, but we've got a green lab um, consumables guide. So um, tips on how to reduce single-use plastics in labs. We've got one for equipment um, and they're on the UCL website. Uh, so please do check them out. Uh, and they're linked in throughout LEAF as well. Now, I'll just quickly say LEAF, you know, it, it's been an incredible ride um, running this program. Uh, and, you know, we've been online just over a year and we've hit 68 institutions in 11 countries with um, 1,000 labs and 1,600 users. And it's it's the world's largest green lab program now. And, you know, it's just been... The uptake's been incredible, the reception, and it's just kind of motiv motivated us to keep going. Uh, and so I should also say thank you to everybody who has taken part, because honestly, your actions have helped validate why we're doing this, and um, and just a big thank you. Um, I, I need to say thanks as well to the UKRN, which is the UK Reproducibility Network, and they've supported our research quality criteria. And we've been working with some of the funders because the long-term goals of LEAF is actually, like Athena Swan, is that you know we can integrate into funding mechanisms so this becomes commonplace. You know, we don't want this to be um, an extra that everybody has to do. We want it to be supported from within um, and supported appropriately um, because right now sustainability is an extra thing that people do voluntarily. Um, and we need to make it commonplace and integrated so that um, it, it's, um, you know, it's... It, it's like everything else, you know, we just do it. And this is what a criteria looks like, but I'm just going to skip ahead. So um, I want to give a shout out also for the importance of technicians. Um, University of Exeter was the second institution in the world that reached 100% of their labs um, to get um, in, a, in a green lab program. And they did it through their technical services. And, um, you know, we've been supported um, at least by the National Technician Development Center. And it's just been incredible to see what technicians can do in these spaces. I, you know, I just, I can't, I can't say how important technicians are and lab managers, research staff to supporting this. And, you know, researchers, of course, as well, you know, we, we need everybody on board um, for this stuff. So um, the Medical Research Council have signed up, which was incredible. Um, NERC have signed up um, some of their sites, uh, like the British Antarctic Survey, and we've got a lab in the Antarctic, um, <laughs> which is, uh, got a bronze award, which was fantastic. Um, and, you know, we've seen some universities, I just love this, this was an elevator at the University of Copenhagen, um, which was just great to see, um, you know, it was just really motivating. So um, I think that's it for now. I've, I've tried to fit in quite a bit in a short amount of time. Sorry if it was a bit rushed. Um, please do, you can, you can find me on Twitter. I, I want to say thank you to the organizers today. Um, so uh, to everybody who's uh, listened and taken part in LEAF, um, I want to say thank you to Susan um, for facilitating um, and also to Margaret Jacobs um, and, uh, and everybody at UCL and King's who's taken part in the programs. I haven't put up my King's email, but you can, um, to be honest, you can write me there, but it's um, martin.farley at kcl.ac.uk uh, or if you're at UCL, please write me there. Um, and uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And apologies, I can't be there in person to take some questions, but please do write me if you have anything. Uh, and uh, have a lovely day and hope you enjoyed the session. Okay. Okay, thank you so much to Dr. Farley for uh, presenting today. It is a shame we didn't get to meet him in person, but he is a local of UCL, so we will be able to... Uh, whoa, no spoilers. 
Um, so we will be able to ask him any questions in person and you guys can also find him on Twitter where he's very active. Um, it's the most exciting time now. We're ready for the awards. So I'm going to welcome Professor Tom Carlson, our Head of Education, back up to the stage. That's not a clap for me, that's a clap for all of you. Um, thank you so much to all of these fantastic student presentations that we've had today. I'm just overwhelmed by the breadth of uh, uh, research that's going on across the division, but not just that, the integrity with which you're doing it, and all of the other things that you're managing to do at the same time. So whether that's music, sport, entertainment, baking, there have been so many extracurricular activities that you've managed to keep doing whilst doing this amazing research. So well done to all of you. Um, thank you for taking part today. Um, thank you to all the judges, because I just know this is an absolutely incredibly difficult uh, thing to come to any sort of consensus on, on these when we've got such high quality presentations. So I'm not going to go through all the judges, but thank you everybody for actually um, making some judgments on these. Um, Obviously, thank you to our two keynote speakers who um, unfortunately couldn't be here in person, but I think they had some really interesting talks. So thank you to Professor Karinchi Gurusami and also to Dr. Martin Farley. And I know I already thanked them right at the beginning because I didn't want to forget. But thank you again to the organizing team, uh, Susan, Annie, um, Katerina, Sean, and of course Jason Peacock who has done some very last minute things sorting everything out to make it all run very smoothly today. So thank you and thank you to the team making YouTube work um, at the back. Very much appreciated. So without further ado, I'm going to go on to the prizes. But before we start with the, um, the award for today, we have a, a very special award. Um, unfortunately, Hafiz cannot be here today with us, but I understand that he's watching live on YouTube, so hello, Hafiz. Um, a massive congratulations for winning the Scales Prize, um, for which there is a, a certificate. I don't know whether you can see that, but there's a certificate and a very nice-looking medal, which we will get across to you in, in due course. So... Um, the Scales Prize is awarded for the best overall individual research project by a postgraduate taught student within the field of orthopaedics and musculoskeletal science each year. Um, and lots of nominations come in from the board of examiners of, of all different programs across the division. So well done, Hafiz, who's, who's really done a fantastic uh, job on his project, which was looking at the correlation between Visa A score and lower limb strength in Achilles tendinopathy. Um, and he uh, graduated from the MSc in sports medicine, exercise and health uh, in the 2021 cohort. So well done. And <laughs> OK, so now we move on, uh, 10 turks now, to the best undergraduate uh, presentation. Um, and this prize goes to Andreas uh, Samutis, who presented on a video presentation online. So perhaps you're watching. I hope you are. Congratulations. Um, the comment that we got from the judging panel was it was a very well-structured presentation. The impact of the research was very clear, being able to personalize the problem and engage the public. He also presented very well the novelty of his research. The methods were well-described and simple. So, uh, congratulations, uh, Andreas. Again, we have a, a lovely certificate which will be making its way to you in due course. Um, and now we shall move on to the next winners. So, the next prize category was the best postgraduate taught presentation. And this was Jenny Patita. Um, Jenny, do you want to come up? And uh, maybe you can come here so that everybody can see you on YouTube. Can we see? Can we see on YouTube? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, congratulations, Jenny. Um, the judging panel said that despite an extremely competitive session, Jenny was right. We seem to have saved the best for last. This talk was very informative, clear, impactful, and Jenny's passion for the topic shone through. Thank so, you very much. Exactly.
Okay, so moving swiftly onwards to the best postgraduate research presentation. And this was Bo. Congratulations. Here's your certificate. <laughs> um, so the comments from the judging panel, um, Bo's presentation showed excellent science communication skills, um, along with clarity of purpose and a genuine passion for research. Thank well you. done, congratulations, Bo. And the next prize category is the best individual image. So without further ado, Adriana Radu. Um, <laughs> Andrew, we thought that uh, uh, the uh, we thought that it reflects a love for science beautifully to us with a very clear message. The heart shape makes even more sense now that she's told us she's a romantic. <laughs> um, I think the image fits uh, well with STEM and tells a clear story. Love of science. Congratulations again. Thank you. Okay, and. It wouldn't be a student symposium if we didn't have some people's choice going in here, okay? So we gave everyone inside the room the opportunity uh, to vote for the people's choice. We also gave all of our viewers on YouTube uh, the opportunity to vote for the people's choice. Um, and I'm going to take an executive decision here. Um, I hope you don't all shoot me down. So the people's choice, we had two awards. We had the uh, people's choice award for the best presentation and we had the People's Choice Award for the most entertaining presentation. And there were some really hot contenders there. And it just so happens that the same person won both awards. So I think it would be a really nice thing if uh, one person gets one award, and then I'm going to make the executive decision to award the second prize to the next category. OK? So the person who won People's Choice Award for the best presentation has actually already won an award today, so really on fire, Jenny Petita, who'd like to come up. Please come up, we've got another certificate. You won't have enough room on your walls for all of these. <laughs> Congratulations again, Jenny. So, both the experts and the people's choice. It's a fantastic achievement. Well done. And then a really close contender for both of these people's choices awards as well was Nur Zaini. Congratulations. Please come up and accept this picture. There we go. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks. Okay, what I forgot to say is there is a cash prize for all of those winners as well. Um, unfortunately, I don't have all the cash on me today because uh, it's a lot of cash. No, it, it's, it's a nice uh, a token of pre appreciation. Um, so that will be making its way to each of the prize winners uh, in due course as well. But at least you've got your certificates uh, for now. I think that's the end of all of my... Uh, my spiel. So um, again, thank you ever so much for, for participating today. Um, I hope you've really enjoyed today as much as I have. I hope you've enjoyed face-to-face, -face giving presentations, chatting to each other in the breaks. Um, and hopefully you haven't had enough of that chatting yet, because I know that for those of you inside the room, um, we've got a, a nice little drinks reception outside, and I'm sure you've got burning questions to ask uh, everyone when we've seen all of these different scientific techniques and things that you want to pick each other's brains. So have a chat, talk about science, talk about your hobbies, um, and enjoy some, some drinks outside now. Thank you very much, everyone.